Yo, how are you doing, folks? Welcome to episode 103. I couldn't get my fingers out there. 103, we'll get there <laughs> eventually. Um, yeah, we're moving ever forward with this new century. Uh, as I said, we're going to be kind of trying to pick up on uh, some of the guests that I've really missed here within the UK scene as we're moving sort of further abroad. We're getting a lot more uh, interest with American guests, more continental European guests as well. And I just want to make sure that we're not missing any uh, any corners, any blind spots uh, here within the UK industry. Obviously, there are many, many people who have been involved in getting the scene and the industry from where it was to where it is today. Obviously, Ignore my camera, please, folks. It's having a little bit of a funny day today. <laughs> it is Sunday, so I'm going to let it rest a bit if it jumps off. Um, but yeah, wanted to make sure that we get the, the stories and the narratives of the people on, on all sides. I hate that expression because I don't like the idea of there being sides because we're not or shouldn't be a conflict with each other. Um, but yeah, today's guest is a, a continuation of this attempt to grab these these stories. Um, so without further ado, we'll move forward with uh, an introduction. Bit of a poor segue there, guys. I'm not really feeling the humour this morning. My camera's annoying me, so I'm not going to uh, have a go at it. So we'll just stop it. We'll keep moving forward uh, with the introduction. Today's guest is an XTV producer, a CBD and prescription cannabis specialist. We'll discuss the reason I've termed that that way shortly. Uh, author, writer, and host of the Cannabis Voices podcast. They are Mary Biles. How are you doing there? Hello. Good morning slash afternoon. We're on that cusp, I guess. How are you doing? Yep. I'm very good. So I'm, like I said, I'm slightly annoyed at my camera this morning, but I think if I approach it with humour, it yeah. will understand that I'm not going to throttle it and thus it won't shut down out of uh, being intimidated. Yeah, <laughs> good call, good call. And happy mm. Sunday. Happy Sunday in... Oh, I'm ignoring it. Happy Sunday <laughs> indeed. I'm just going to fiddle with that. But for anyone, I'm fiddling Have with the fiddle. camera. Yeah, there's a cable here. That. It's almost strobing, isn't it? It's kind of yeah. yeah be, it's a disco, cool color. disco camera. Yeah, well, it is Sunday. I suppose it could be quite psychedelic Sunday with the uh, <laughs> yeah the lines across the screen. Uh, right. I'm just going to ignore this yeah. and move, for, move forward okay. with this. Uh, very professional here at the Simple Life. I'll have, I'll have you know. Um, <laughs> we are also a one man team, so that explains quite a lot as well. Um, for people, I guess, that don't uh, maybe know yourself, um, yeah. could you maybe give us a brief introduction of sort of uh, how you first got involved with with cannabis and sort of what you do within uh, the cannabis space? Yeah, it's interesting. You're sort of talking about, you know, me being part of the, the UK scene or, or, you know, kind of cannabis world, because actually my journey started in Spain. So I kind of, I've been back in the UK for three years, um, but I really... Yeah, I mean, this is a kind of global movement. And so I, you know, my 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 heart in a way actually still kind of resides in, in Spain, right? I was living for, for almost nine years in Seville in southern Spain. Um at the time, um I was a kind of blogger. I just started writing about actually I'd written something about um ayahuasca and and, and different things really so I was sort of you know, writing I'd been an English teacher and just kind of living living the good life um in in Andalusia um and you know in 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 Spain there it has its kind of unique um scene so you know there were um and there are cannabis clubs I mean Barcelona is kind of the main epicenter in Seville there's about five um cannabis clubs um but I was you know in honesty I wasn't I have to you know full disclosure apart from prior to this apart from you know kind of in, in my early 20s when I lived in Madrid um smoking uh, Moroccan hash and and actually when I moved back to the UK um after that uh, I'm one of those people that you know kind of high THC we doesn't agree with me. So I had like quite a long time of just not really having any connection with, with cannabis actually. And it was through mm -hmm. the first kind of little dot um, that sort of, I ultimately kind of joined up to how I got into this world was an ex-boyfriend um, who started growing um, um, because he had a friend who, who had, I think it was lung cancer. And so he decided to, to kind of um, grow. And I remember watching he sort of showed me the Rick Simpson um, video and like it was the first time I'd heard of like cannabinoids and um, cannabidiol and I was like well, you know what the hell is this it was like but it's like a little seed that had been planted basically then we split up and and instead of like kind of making you know cannabis oil and, and giving it to his friend he just ended up selling it and going on holiday to South America so it was like, mm. but anyway but it was a kind of you know it was a 
uh, a seed that had been been sown. Um, and then really the kind of turning point was <clears throat> um, a really good friend of mine um, who um, is from Belgium. Her mum had pancreatic cancer and this was, you know, she was living in Belgium. And, you know, it was at the kind of, you know, the terminal stage, it was terminal cancer. She'd had all the various treatments, chemo, radiotherapy, and, you know, she was dying, basically. Um, <clears throat> and um, for her, morphine did not agree with her. Um, it really kind of messed with her head. For her, actually, it didn't really help with the pain. So she was really, really suffering um, and had no quality of life. Um, I've always felt very strongly about... Um, trying to enable as much as it is possible to have a good death. I think we all live our lives completely with our heads in the sand about the fact that we're going to fucking die at some point. I mean, sorry, folks, but it's going to happen. <laughs> um, and yeah, and so I saw like with my friend and basically her, her kind of a mum's GP, it, it, I think it still isn't legal in, in Belgium. It's one of the few European countries where they haven't really moved forward. But he found some kind of loophole um, so essentially, um, my friend's mum had um, uh, uh, cannabis all over the last sort of six weeks or eight weeks of her life. And it was just, well, it was transformative in the respect that she had a good death and a good, you know, last kind of eight weeks of her life for her, actually, compared to the morphine that actually did help with her pain. <clears throat> um, but, you know, beyond that, she regained her lucidity. Um, which I think is really, really important. I mean, I've seen my own mum, you know, she didn't tolerate morphine very well. And every time she had it, it was like, you lost them, you know, it, like it's like a ticking a sledgehammer to pain. And so, and with, you know, my friend's mum also, you know, she had an appetite, she could sleep better, you know, she was a little bit stoned. So she kind of, you know, just had to kind of giggle with her family, you know, which actually being able to laugh when you're dying, I think that's, you know, that's pretty precious actually. Um, and so, yeah, when she died, um, I'm going to carry on, even though I lost you, lost you for a second. Um, <clears throat> when she when she died, um, it was with uh, dignity. It was with dignity, and and um, and I don't know. I can remember it really clearly, being in my kitchen in Seville, um, and just just being like, I was just like really angry, really angry that you know so many people um, are being deprived of just that simple human right of 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 being able to you know live the rest of those few last weeks of their life with dignity and in, and in the best way possible and then to have a good death so simply on that and at that point I didn't know anything about I'm just speaking to a black screen now I didn't sorry, know anything yeah. about the the anti-tumoral you know sort of activity of of cannabinoids etc but anyway I, yeah, I was in my kitchen in Seville. Anna was telling me all about this. And I just simply made a promise that I was going to do something about it without knowing what that meant. Um, and then two weeks later, there was a hemp fair, um, Expo Canyamo, as it's called. Canyamo is hemp in, in Spanish, in Seville. And I just like got a press pass, trundled along um, and just spoke to people really. And this was 2000 and I think it was... 2016, I think. I've kind of lost track, really. Um, and so before, like, CBD had really kicked off. And there was two CBD companies there. There was um, Endoka, who are Danish, kind of one of the early pioneers in the whole kind of European um, CBD kind of market. And there was another Spanish company. And it just so happened that Endoka were looking for a writer. Um, and, um, yeah, so it was like, it was crazy. It was like... Within, so I spoke to the, you know, the CEO's mum, and she was like, "Oh wow, amazing!" Um, and we, you know, a few days later, I had a, a Zoom kind of interview with the head of marketing, and like in between promising to my friend that I was going to do something about it, like two weeks later, I was I had a job in the CBD industry, mm -hmm. which wasn't even an industry really back then. Um, and so it was just, yeah, that's how it started, and and it was, this was like before companies were. I don't know, it was so professional. So they, you know, they didn't really, this company, even though they're one of the pioneers, they didn't really know anything about digital marketing or anything like that. So they just kind of gave me free reign, you know, I just like could write what the hell I wanted. I mean, when, when I say that, you know, um, it meant that I wasn't just writing about CBD, I was writing about cannabis in general. I was writing about the endocannabinoid system. 
I was really lucky living in in Spain. Um, actually, just a few weeks after starting with them, I went to um, um, a conference in Madrid run by um, the Spanish um, medical cannabis. I know we don't like that word, but anyway, con- conservatory. They use medicinals and medicinal, um, which I think is different, actually. That's, um, yeah, uh, I recently uh, I, started well- using medicinal. I was going to say, well, we'll uh, keep going with your anecdote, but yeah, put a pin yeah. in that because that is that's a conversation. Uh, yeah. Shortly, yeah. Um, so, and at you know at that that conference, I met you know in Spain. There's a really in terms of like research into the anti-tumoral um, properties of cannabis. That's kind of where some of the again using that word pioneers, but like you know the 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 teams that have made those first early breakthroughs. So that coming from the Complutense University Madrid, you've got Cristina Sanchez, you've got Manuel Guzman. And so they're all part of the of this observatory, basically. So I got to kind of chat to them and then, you know, and and, and could just sort of interview them, you know, like um, and it was just, you know, so wonderful because there was a kind of innocence and naivety back then, which was which was lovely. And and you know what? The products were better, you know. And I again it's something we can kind of go on to, but it's like. I actually, you know, that's back in, you know, those days when I was having the kind of Indoka products, you know, particularly their pace, like that actually did something. I, I really, you know, I doubt I have this and it's, it saddens me. I really kind of question is the word is whether these products are on the market actually bloody do anything right now. But that's another thing to talk about. But that, that's how it started. So, yeah, so I was really and then from that, you know, with the kind of curiosity uh, and wanting to learn about cannabis, I joined um, a club in Seville. Um, and uh, ironically, it was quite funny, actually. Um, so I, I, as I say, I used to be an English teacher and we used to get um, in, you know, we go for an eight, eight in the morning class to this like engineering company and, you know, a bunch of us in the car. Um, and um, and it turns like one of the guys, one of the teachers, an uh, American guy, actually ran a cannabis club. So, you know, I only found out after <laughs> like all this time. So I joined his cannabis club um, and um, yeah, and just sort of, you know, you'd go along and there'd be, you know, the kind of menu. Um, there was, you know, it was sort of, it was sort of, it's really the only information you have was whether it was a sativa or indica or was it a hybrid, but, um, and, you know, it was really lovely. And I could, they'd like, I was really crap at rolling joints. So they'd roll them for me. And I'm like, I'm honestly, I understand why you're like, who is this woman? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm an accidental advocate. It's like literally, you know, I, I kind of, I, I can't stand injustice, um, and and this is just one injustice in the world that kind of you know, just I don't know captured me in a way, and 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 then everything just seemed to just kind of fall in into place, and you know I, I do think sometimes uh, things are meant to be in a certain way, so it almost like all the previous experience, you know, as well as being a um uh right uh, working in tv i'd also been a complementary therapist so you know my kind of you know training in that and learning about anatomy and physiology really helped with the writing that i was doing um and just i've just been felt so grateful really to to just be able to learn about the endocannabinoid system which is still one of my kind of great passions and and find myself sort of being a science writer, which I always sort of have to laugh to myself because I barely kind of scrape through my GCSE science. But I guess I have like a kind of questioning mind, you know, I just want to know how things work, really. And I also, I kind of get a bit sort of cheesed off with, you know, because there is this sort of narrative that that cannabis is a cure-all. And there's, you know, there is a lot of kind of content that's out there, which, you know, picks up on some preclinical study in a test tube, you know, and then extrapolates from that, that this is going to be cure all our malaises. And it's just simply not true, actually. So for me, it's really important to kind of unpick that. And, you know, and, and actually now, I suppose, as well as, you know, as I, 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 the last few years I've been writing for um, Project CBD. So when I, when I came into the world, like I remember my Ian, who was my kind of boss was like, okay, you just need to immerse yourself in Project CBD. So Project CBD being um, a kind of nonprofit California and educational um, site run, um, started by Martin Lee and various other people that just has solid uh, journalism actually about not just CBD, but about the cannabis plants in general. They kind of call out anything that's kind of, you know, 
shoddy journalism um, and and they were my reference point really so for me to actually be one of their kind of contributing writers these days um, yeah I, I kind of it does actually you know it feels good it feels it feels really good and that people can yeah trust I think people can trust what I write that that's you know that I really that's one of the most important things if I you know that I can do that just People can read stuff that I've written, know that it's you know really well researched and referenced, and and I'm not just making shit up basically. So, mm. um, and also a chance for to people to tell tell their stories as well. So, you know, from Project CBD, I was approached by Harper Collins. You know, they kind of wanted to jump on the whole CBD buzz and have a CBD book, and <clears throat> so again, it was just something that really happened so quickly and easily, and. Um, I wrote the book and um, about CBD and you know essential um, it was the CBD book and essential guide but something that was really important was was telling people stories as well you know so I, I um without having to reach my network out too far it was there was you know really transformative life transformative stories that came from different people you know some from the industry some just you know ordinary people who whose lives, you know, just being transformed, you know, and, and were in a, a better place after taking CBD. And from that came the podcast because uh, um, I just really wanted people to hear their voices rather than just read their stories. Because I think, you know, as you know yourself, it's very different when you actually hear the emotion and you hear the passion and you can actually, you know, really get to grips with with who they are. So, yeah, there you go. That's me. <laughs> I was uh, very concise and uh, oh, very, 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 <laughs> no, very good, very professionally uh, tolerated with my camera having a little uh, <laughs> a little difficulty there. I'm not quite sure what it is. I have a sneaking suspicion that it is this time of year and the equipment lays cold and then it turns on and gets very warm and it just over panics itself. Mm. But yeah, uh, thank you for persisting with that. No uh, worries. Say, very professional outfit. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's a very similar story that I hear from a lot of people that, as in the initial part of it, um, that it is somebody close to them that has this this transformative experience with cannabis and they see the truth firsthand, as you've just described and articulated with the difference between reading somebody's story and hearing it in the, from their own voice, uh, from their own mouth and in their own voice. It's that emotive kind of nature to it and it becomes a, a driver. And I think... For those of us that that seek to write injustice, that seek to draw a light to things that the buggers that intrinsically, moralistically, ethically itch us, make us itchy, and and need to to act upon it. And I think again, as you you described, I, I think I've the, I had a wonderful conversation with a guest previously about like determinism versus sort of free will. And on the grandest sort of scales, or zoomed out, I think everything is is um diverging toward uh, sorry moving towards um into interconnection and i think that everything you've described there of your background of all of these skill sets that you've accrued the prior experience then comes to fruition and to flower into this 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 work that you are you are doing now um mm. and I'm really appreciative of several things that you said during the start there of the products being better at the start of the market i think that's definitely a subject that i'd like to discuss with you um but I think the immediate one we need to start with, given my my previous history, um, is this this concept of the term medical cannabis um, over medicinal use. So I'm very fastidious about language. Uh, the same, I, to full disclosure, kicked out of mainstream education, got no prior qualification, ended up kind of getting bullied. I say bullied, uh, friendly bullied by uh, Tyler Green from the from uh, I Smoke Media. And he gave me my first opportunity and got me writing and got me sort of telling my story and, and gathering. And I'm lucky enough now to, to write for Weed World and various other outlets. And as part of that, I'm trying to draw attention to what I see as the deliberate misrepresentation of language and manipulation of it for search engine optimization, market capture, profiteering. Mm -hmm. And the medical cannabis to me is the biggest one because it creates a false dichotomy in that when we say medical cannabis, we're saying that all other cannabis isn't medical. When, when we say mm. this in Spanish, are the medicinal use of says that cannabis, the neutral object and plant, any of the cultivars of the subs of the species, cannabis sativa L, they have intrinsically in them potential therapeutic value when used medicinally. 
Um, Do you think it's been so well thought out, though? I just think it's been like a bit, bit lazy. I don't know, because I am quite new to this, you know, and it's like, I, um, and I'm not so kind of obviously Im embedded in or at all in the world that you come from. Um, so um, <clears throat> I do remember like, um, sorry, my dog's just licking. Sunday, darling. Just in case it, um, <laughs> you just hear like a uh, underlying licking sounds throughout the interview. Um, <laughs> so I, I do remember like um, at the beginning, this is when I was still living in Spain, just thinking, is this like, medical cannabis and medicinal cannabis in Spain that they never they never say medical um and I don't yeah I, I don't know I mean you can tell me when did this term medical cannabis start get start start getting getting used in in the UK it's it's, it's interesting because so uh, to answer your first question I agree I think at first it was lazy then I think it became a deliberate uh way to create legislation for the creation of producers, licensed producers, for them to capture market, for them to uh, monopolize in regions, create vast investment while still demonizing cannabis. So having the benefits of prohibition, but them also being able to grow cannabis and participate in the cannabis industry. And I think that, yeah, it's it's down to this because when we look at the, the dictionary definitions of the two terms, medical pertains to something that is solely designed, created for and within medical practice. Whereas medicinal pertains to a substance, compound, or plant used for therapeutic benefit. So mm. cannabis, a neutral object, grows in a field. We can strip it down. We can make it into like burning blocks. We can make it into concrete, into plastics, into uh, graphene. Uh, we could derive it into a drug, uh, into hash and resins and oils. Um, or it could just be just smoked as, as a plant. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have an intention in it, however it's grown. So mm. even when it's grown to GMP, good manufacturing practice, um, I believe that the reason they're calling it titled medical cannabis is it allows them to create these subsets of regulations. So if you look back to the origins of this, it was medical marijuana mm. back, in the, back in back in the states. I was going to so, ask that what's what yeah. it, what's you know how is it being described in the US? Because I guess that's kind of you know where they. It's interesting. Now they've adopted our language. My previous guest, uh, who is the breeder of Stardog, which is considered the most like recreational strain that's out, uh, cultivar that's out there in the UK, sort of thing. He, he's using the language, and as we were discussing after recording, that is the accepted terminology now in the states is medical cannabis. If you look at Thailand mm. and other places, it's now medical cannabis is the term. And if you look at it, mm. it's actually capital M, capital C. When mm -hmm. we study lang language, you're an English teacher. You, that then creates is it not a proper noun? Uh, or is it a proper noun? Yeah, and yeah. yeah. It's it's then definable. Mm. Uh, it has a different legal uh, meaning. So in the state to go, I'm running two parallel thoughts here. So I'm going to park that one for a second, go back to the, med <laughs> the med medical, medical marijuana was because in the States, they, with the hemp act in 1937, they basically forced cannabis into two categories. They said there's hemp and that's low THC and there's marijuana. Both of them in the American interpretation are cannabis sativa L, but the bad one is marijuana and that's got the drug element. The mm -hmm. non-drug element is hemp. And so then when they've started to discover that there's therapeutic benefit from marijuana under their language interpretation of it, um, they've then termed that as medical marijuana so that they can, again, still keep the constraints around marijuana being, I hate saying this, I hate the word marijuana, so the, yeah. this is really irritating my brain. Mm -hmm. um, but they then kept that sort of terminology. And so now in the States with the Hemp Act, you've now got hemp, which is below 0.3% THC, and any of the byproducts extracted from that. So that's now every other cannabinoid than naturally occurring Delta 9 THC. Marijuana is containing Delta 9 THC. That's dangerous, criminal in federally, mm. but states allow the recreational sale. The then they've created as medical cannabis is just the cultivars from that marijuana that they've then grown to these practices under these regulations that mean in the legal sense, it's classified almost like a brand name as a different thing. So then when we look at, again, medical cannabis in the English language, in the uh, English definitions, to go to your second question of when it started in the UK, colloquially, as in non-defined, just in our daily parlance and the way we were communicating with each other, it seems to appear 
around 2016, around the same time as sort of CBD really starts kicking off. Mm. I feel it's a, it's a way that is in tandem with the reduction of the potency of CBD products, that it was then to go that good potent cannabis products should always be mm. medicinal. Anything that's kind of novel and just got five, 10% in that gives you just a, oh, I feel it slightly and you get a more placebo than anything effect that sort of split in the market. But when it really got codified was 2018 with the, the change of the law on November 1st. So the legislation, which I can't remember the shorthand for, basically retrospectively under the 2001 misuse of drugs regulations created Schedule Two med- uh, medical cannabis. Then mm-hmm. when you look at M- MHRA's documents, which is what defines the term of medical cannabis, it starts by saying is and or a cannabis-based preparation designed for human consumption is and or, which again, understanding English, they're then saying that medical cannabis is cannabis because they have to legally define it, but they've created that obstruction in that they can then say medical cannabis at the pulpit as a politician, but then still go skunk and go after the street dealers and the non-regulated, the legacy market, the people that they're demonizing. But all of the bad things of cannabis, that's that's that skunk stuff. All of the good mm. stuff that's medical cannabis and it allows them to create these these binary camps and for me it's it's about class obviously we had a, a conversation prior to the the recording of this where I was, I was very honest with you about what i see as potentially some of my own shortcomings as being a northerner that's lived under thatcherism and the consequence of this and then watching quite conservative politicians and individuals start to make large amounts of money by saying medical cannabis but then still funding and attacking mm. cannabis and cannabis consumers and so I think it, it, I agree. Yeah, that was the longest way to answer those questions. Yeah. But I, I, I hope I did articulately. I think there's also a kind of misappropriation just of the word medicine, actually, general in general. It's like um yeah. I just get I just get so kind of frustrated. It's like, you know, for example, food is medicine. You know, I, I mean when I was sort of writing a, yeah. Yeah. Um you know, when I when I was, uh, I mean, like, I don't know, playing Scrabble could be medicine if it's like creating neuroplasticity in your brain and actually then, you know, helping to protect you from um, neurodegenerative diseases or Alzheimer's or whatever. It's like, I don't know. I, I, I do think it's, um, it just kind of represents how in society everything has to be kind of tied up with regulation. Um, you know, we're, 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 and, and we're kind of told it's there to protect us. Um, you know, I see that with the kind of, with the CBD industry, it's like, um, oh no, this is, this is to protect you from the bad, bad actors and not, and it's like, okay, thanks. You know, I, I think I've, there are probably other better ways to go about it. So we've ended up with something which just doesn't work. So, oh, I wonder what that's all about. It's, um, so I don't know. I think it's just this, yeah, this this kind of well, it's just it's you know you, you know more than I do. It's like we're we're not allowed to have well, to have the kind of given the responsibility for ourselves. It's like you know the choice. It's you know we're treated like children essentially. Um, yeah. So it's all this. It's disempowering, which is such a great shame because you know one of the the main things that I've you know I've kind of learned about about um, cannabis um, for people's health, and I'm sure we can kind of go beyond the health aspect, is just how empowering it is actually. Um, and you know, it's like it's being sort of shoehorned because we're not as as citizens in general right now. We're being constantly disempowered. You know, it's 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 just for me, it's just like another bolt on to the the overall disempowerment that's 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 coming from above basically so maybe in that way cannabis is no different really we're just you know it's a choice and and freedom is is being gradually just sort of removed and we're sleepwalking into that um i mean i guess as a movement that's something you know that probably is different because you've been fighting for that freedom for such a long time um and to end prohibition but I don't know. For me, it's not surprising. It's not surprising in a way. They've kind of given an inch, you know, to keep people happy a bit. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I, it's, I'm. I feel like we have to kind of reclaim medicine. What is medicine in itself? You know, it's not just what this is part of the kind of pharmaceutical paradigm. Mm. 
Yeah, exactly that. And it's, it's it's interesting because that also played out in the CBD space because they then came to protect us again from the bad actors yeah. of going, well, if you sell CBD, you can't make medical claims. And it was like, well, no, but we've got rodent models. We've got human models. I mean, this was years before the sheer volume of data that we have now coming out of you know places like Australia, Israel, Canada, America, uh, Colombia, all sorts of places are popping up, really starting to, to do some good research here that is showing that you know what is true of cannabis in Zimbabwe is true of it in, in, in the US. It's yeah, the plant, I, I, the I do. Yeah, but I do. I mean, I, I kind of, I don't know. I'm in, I'm sort of in two minds about that because, um, because I, you know, I was, you know, sort of, as I said at the beginning when I was, um, you know, started writing for Indoka, it wasn't that I was making like really claimy, um, articles or writing claimy articles. I was just writing about the science really, but that, that now would not be allowed. You know, you're not even to, allowed to kind of include references to studies or even mention, uh, health conditions or illnesses on a website, no, let alone. But what annoys me, really annoys me, um, is essentially what it's done when, when all this kind of came in and, and the MHRA, you know, um, uh, were kind of clamping down all this. It was the small companies who were who were trying to be compliant, bless them, a lot of them, you know, and they're really worried because I used to kind of do a bit of training for them. Um, and they'd be really, really trying to be compliant, really trying to understand the rules. And actually, I remember writing for um, a company, a great um, CBD company. I give them a little plug called Spirit of Hemp because they are, you know, they've been around for a long time. And and they, for me, they really do embody the the spirit of hemp, but also the spirituality actually of of of, of cannabis and and uh, uh, in general. But um, but that that's an aside. But I I was. I, I was writing some content um, and um, and I have seen, you know, the kind of stuff that the MHRA picks up on. And it's not just about, you know, I remember, um, I'm sure they won't mind me, me mentioning, but they were, you know, there was stuff that they had about other ingredients that weren't related to cannabis, actually, some, um, that, that, you know, they perhaps mentioned a health condition. So it wasn't, it's not just against cannabis, but anyway, but getting back to, you know, you've got people, you know, these smaller CBD companies are trying to do it right. And then you've got these, like, uh, e-marketplaces, naming no names, who are venture capitalist backed, um, got you know their own sort of digital marketing departments. They don't give a shit. They don't give a shit. And it's not even like they're writing decent content that's helpful. They're just like SEOing the shit out of it. You know, it's like the kind of classic uh, CBD for cancer, CBD for pain, and then they'll just like like cram it full of like uh, keywords sorry to kind of be boring about this people who don't know about <laughs> search engine no, I'm, optimization I'm, 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 but I'm it's pers- like i'm personally loving this because yeah i have, I have a website that i'm yeah, currently rebuilding and it it bothers me i want to tell truthful stories i want to show correlations and speak of ideas and share opinions i don't want to misrepresent anything and i want to deliberately state that this is what this is but just to have that that kind of open dialogue doesn't seem yeah. to exist because if you're not on that first page of, of reference on Google or whatever your yeah. search engine platform is, you weren't going to get read. And and actually, if you if you happen to ever read any of those articles, particularly for these like e marketplaces, they're, they're just like it's it's like keyword crams. They're like about four thousand words long because that's whatever you know the Google algorithm wants these days in order for you to mm. rank. And it's repetitive, and it's just dirge, frankly. Um, and and but and it's also non-compliant, just to point out. But nothing happens. Nothing happens. So there's kind of really the MHRA is toothless. You know, it, it is yeah. completely toothless. And you might get, you know, you have to kind of remove stuff or whatever. But so I kind of, I don't know. It's like I, I do think, um, you know, writing um, about how CBD is going to cure cancer. That that's. And you know, as as your kind of content to sell CBD products, I don't think that's responsible. I don't think that's responsible yeah. because you know there are preclinical studies. Um, there isn't there isn't that much that's moved onto the kind of the you know the kind of RCT stage for various reasons. But I don't know. I think you you have to be responsible. Um, and so I guess you know that that's. That's what I do when I write for Project CBD. You know, I kind of really do a deep dive on what where we are with the research, but also, you know, kind of speak to doctors and, and speak to have some kind of um, anecdotal case histories as well. But um, yeah, I don't know. And it's one of the reasons actually why I ended up leaving the CBD industry because I'm not really in it anymore. 
I just, I'm just got, I've just got so sick of it. I'm so sick of the CBD nonsense because um, it's so far away from how it all started. You know, it's like, I mean, what is it anymore? What is it? What is it's like? And, and also, it's because actually, it was almost, you know, the calling it CBD oil in the first place. It, it, these were, you know, hemp extracts that were abundant in CBD, but you know, also contain THC and lots of other things as well. You know, but even in even in that, I mean, we'll go on to the hemp thing in a second. Yeah. Um, in in the yeah, I I'm trying to figure out what my NDA said. I, I think in all vaguety, I can say that I've ghost written okay, as long as I'm not saying who the hell it was for. Um, I I, I was ghost writing a few years ago for a nameless uh, CBD website and was was quite happy with them because it was before this purge. And I would always make sure that everything I said was was compliant to my own conscience. That anything I claimed, I made sure was a claim of the author, and not of of uh, um, of the the website as a whole. So while it still was kind of muddy in the waters, um, it was never intent to just sell their brand. I was I took the role as a way of kind of doing just enough that they would publish the work, but enough that I could basically say to people every time that when I mentioned CBD, hey, look at THC, hey, look at the other ones, check it out, check it out, check it out. And it was, and it wasn't until uh, I started to get pressure to perform to SEO levels and oh, to, just... uh, exactly, it was just, <laughs> I, 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 no, I, I love what I do with, with, yeah, with Weed Worlds because my editor, bless her Sam, she has never edited me once in four and a half years of publication not once she's rang me once and kind of gone oh after the fact but she'll always because again we it's it's my name my work it's my opinion it's not representative of the magazine for they've given me the space to publish it and i think that 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 line has to be drawn we have to have the opinion-based conversations and the science should be separate from the salesman so it's to me it's even still weird that all these cbd websites that solely sell their own cbd products then produce all of this content geared solely to buy that product we don't see that in any other industry really. well it is marketing though isn't it it's, it's you know you have to remember this is digital digital marketing and I think that's where I don't know is there and I, I think about this sometimes like is there something that's comparable um to the kind of CBD industry or these CBD products where you know because you, it does kind of bring together you know I think a lot of them still hopefully maybe not the kind of the maybe the you know venture capitalist back ones you know there is still like a, a passion behind it and you and okay you want to sell your products but you also kind of you know, want to get the message out there, etc. Um, but um, but it, I don't know. It's like, is there anything else that we can compare it to? But that's, that's because for me, it was interesting because when I started, I wasn't. I didn't even realize I was working in the marketing department. I didn't know. I just thought I was just. I was just hired to write cool stuff, and that's what I did. And I remember there was a point in time when the company got a bit more savvy, and they're like, "Oh shit, we need to like maybe you know, kind of." do a bit more kind of mm, search engine optimized stuff. And I remember, you know, they got their digital marketing agency involved and, and we did like a kind of, I had to go up to Barcelona and spend about four days. And it felt like a sausage factory of writing the most like dirty, awful content. And that for me was at a point in time when I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. But that's, you know, that's, you know, if you're going to, get on the sort of first two pages ranking on Google, um, one, you have to write the dirge and two, you have to be non-compliant um, because, you know, you want to be ranking when people, you know, your average person wants to know whether CBD is going to help them with anxiety, whether it's going to help them with pain, whether, you know, it's going to like cure their cancer. And so that's, you know, that's, that's the stuff that in an ideal world you're going to be ranking on. So, you know, you're going to find a way probably of trying to do that and, you know, not be compliant and write some old nonsense <laughs> so um again yeah. that that should then be triggering under a search engine optimization opinion pieces that are then hard linked to data that is then just giving people it's it's like creating trying to create a two-way conversation with the individual rather than upselling them on the concept it's kind of going that all right here's the studies from here 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 and here and here and allowing people to make that that fair uh assessment because it's it's far different than say somebody 
writing uh, as I think we saw something at the start of uh, that which shall not be named because I do not want to be censored again on this podcast uh, beginning with the C that recently occurred it was a pandemic um, that people were saying like oh you can inject bleach you can do all sorts of stuff and those yeah the insane claims that should be regulated whereas then cannabis somebody consuming cannabis other than certain hormone driven cancers um, are we going to then see an issue with, say, THC spiking? You know, obviously, we do have an issue with, say, cytochrome P450, uh, the enzyme in the liver that uptakes and controls um, metabolism of uh, common pharmaceutical drugs, um, mm. because then, yeah, you, you can have issues with the compounding of whatever other things that you are taking. But again, as long as there is that kind of honesty and transparency, whereas that's not brought up by the CBD industry. Another thing I wanted to to ask you about is, uh, again, a couple of studies that were kind of, well, we'll, we'll hide that or we'll rather write it in a way that goes at average dose. But basically a few studies have discovered uh, or have claimed to discover that high do- continual high-dose CBD reduces testosterone levels. Mm. And there really hasn't been, from far as I can see, that kind of conversation. And I've, I've literally, I, I haven't seen that. So that just shows that there hasn't been a conversation. I mean, I'm not like so like, mm-hmm. you know, plowing through every study um, these days as I probably was at the beginning, but that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's just, I'm busy. I've spent a bit of time. I'm now, I'm at the point this as well. Cannabis isn't a panacea. I love this plant. I have dedicated myself mm-hmm. to it and, and to other compounds and substances that have given me my life back. But it has to come with this this honesty and this transparency that it may help, it can help. It, but it also then needs again to get back to the kind of the medical cannabis paradigm. Um, we need the transparency of our individuality to the discussion that our endocannabinoid systems are so unique and will mm. react in different ways, and you will react in different ways to the same cultivar at different times of the day based on what you've eaten, how you've slept, what your mood is, your neuro- neurological state at the time, whether you're thirsty or not. There are so many other it, uncountable variables that are just not discussed. They're trying to, I said they, the grand they. Uh, I believe that the pharmaceutical industrial complex are trying to basically co-opt cannabis and regiment it into single compound, single use. Mm. And this is what I fear has happened with CBD because at the start of it, it was whole plant, air quotes, hemp derived. My issue with hemp derived is hemp doesn't exist. When you look at it, it in, again, in, in the dictionary and in language, hemp is classified as an archaic word describing cannabis sativa L in the English mm. language. Mm-hmm. When colloquially used, because um, it is colloquially not even in legal terms, because if you get an air quotes hemp license in this country, it doesn't say hemp on it anywhere. It says low THC cannabis cultivation. And it just means you don't have to get a dangerous drugs license alongside it mm. because it doesn't contain air quotes, the bad one, THC. So that kind of marketing that we saw from, again, these, I want to say chads, if you know what chad is, these kind of I new money. Uh, Chad is a disparative term created by the Americans to describe kind of upper class, rich white kids, uh, predominantly white males getting into the industry and treating it like uh, like a fraternity mm-hmm. um, and just just big boys over promising, under delivering, chucking all daddy's money away. Um, yeah, so I, I feel that we're in this kind of struggle between the pharmaceutical complex wanting to all right if cannabis is a medicine we should control it therefore it's if it's a medicine it shouldn't also be a recreational substance Mm. in the same way that we saw the medicinalization of kind of heroin was was socially available you could smoke it you know it was as opium it was quite benign then actually by the time we get to carfentanil now through the medicinalization Mm. over a century it's ten thousand times stronger than the natural plant Within 10 years of these air quotes, hemp derived cannabinoids that we're then seeing pop up on the market, we're already at 200 times stronger than THC with TH. Is it THCP or is it HHC? I always mix them up, but now we're at like, obviously messing around with like Delta eight, Delta 10, they're mm-hmm. all of them. We're circumnavigating and avoiding everything we do, avoid THC. And so my mm. issue again, like with, with with the hemp thing, is when companies are saying hemp derived, they're breaking the law as far as I'm concerned. When you look at the listings in the English law for botanically extracted uh, substances, the product has to be defined by its Latin uh, uh, italized name. So when you look at the product and it's, it's botanically extracted, the product it will be italized. So turn to the side, I, I, to typicalize, however you say that. Um, and it will be its Latin name. So the can, Latin name for cannabis is cannabis sativa L. 
Mm. When you then look at the subspecies, there is currently accepted cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. Mm. There is no hemp. So it's, again, it yeah. feels like it's a misrepresentation. And again, it was lazy back when, but then it allows to create this market, this huge market around the world for people to sell all of these cannabis products and all, everything that's cannabis, as long as it doesn't have THC in it. And we're mm. seeing, frankly, bastardized chemicals. You know, we saw this with Pfizer in the 70s. They created a compound that's now commonly known as K2, uh, synthetic cannabinoid, uh, what is it? Uh, synthetic cannabinoid agonist, uh, receptor antagonist um, that's consumed in, in prisons, it's consumed in the street, mm-hmm. street populations. So I, again, I'm just worried that we're in this position that without honesty and this conversation that yes, there can be a CBD industry, but then be honest, if it's synthetic, tell us if it's derived from orange peel or mutated yeast. I know. Tell, yeah. tell us. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that makes, I mean, I, yeah, with the whole kind of novel foods debacle, um, it was interesting to see that some of the first few companies that managed to kind of jump over that first hurdle were actually it was for synthetic cbd and it's like i don't know is it kind of like i don't know is this just a kind of expression of how the humans like to complicate things i don't know it just it just seems like everything could be it should be more simple it should be it should be more simple there's no there's no need I mean, how, like if like an alien came you know i was like what are these bloody humans up to you know they've got this plant that does all these things and yet what they're doing is synthesizing you know making some yeast or whatever and like making one compounds in order to jump through all these like stupid blooming hoops in order to then for people to take this like synthetic i mean it, i suppose you know it's I suppose it's a bit, you know, for me, it's a bit like the entourage effect is, is, you know, kind of talked about just in terms of cannabis, but the entourage effect applies to everything, right? It applies to, you know, why we, you know, it's better to kind of, you know, eat a varied diet rather than just rely on, on the synthetic, um, you know, multivitamins or whatever. It's like, we just like really overcomplicate things. On sort of going back to a point that you made about, you know, sort of the pharmaceutical industry, um, I mean, it seems like then, you know, because of the uh, the fact that, you know, the cannabis plant itself, you can't patent it, it feels like they're not that interested, really. And unless they kind of go down and, you know, and, and um, have some kind of IP for, for, you know, I mean, you know, GW Pharma has found a way around it, but they're not really making that much money, really. They've sent everything up, as I understand it, with lots and lots of patents. So then it makes it very difficult for other players to come into the market. Um, but that, that that's what the 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 banking on at this point the exactly that cannabis isn't the commodity. We've got to remember that for God, the past ten years, data is more valuable than oil and gold, and it's speculate to accumulate. This is the the venture capitalist game, and so this also I guess leads into uh, a conversation about the current prescription system here, sort of in the UK. Mm. Is that I feel that the fact that people are, don't have continuity and consistency of cultivars, despite the fact that we know some of the sizes and scales of these operations, that you, you could quite easily be provided the same product uh, infinitum, that the variance of it is creating data sets. It is creating feedback from the patients about how that cultivar affected them. They obviously then at the other side, at some point in their research and development, regardless of what side of the industry you're on, whether you're producing air quotes medical cannabis or air quotes recreational cannabis, you're still accruing all of that data and information. And what is true of the cultivar that is the same plant that's grown under two different settings is, is true of that genetic. And I think that's what we're, we're seeing a lot of the research. So 10 years ago, everything came out publicly. It all leaked out. Israel, obviously, they dragged their heels. Uh, Raphael Michelem and that they were the epicenter of the research, which actually, when we look at it, was backhandedly being funded by the states for decades um, mm. while they themselves handicapped by going, we'll grow one really shit cultivar yeah. in Missouri and allow them to piss around with it and prove that it doesn't work, but yeah. get all of this other data. Uh, and so there was this period, this renaissance of information just colliding out into the market. And it very much feels like the IP and, and the individuals involved in this uh, that are producing these patents, et cetera, are being bought up. They're now like footballers. And it's they're going around, and I've I've heard narratives of certain doctors that walked out. 
I'm not, I'm going to be speaking to them most, most vaguely I can here for my own legal protection, but somebody walking out of say, potentially, I don't know, maybe a UK based pharmaceutical company that was then potentially maybe, I don't know, hired by, um, a, uh, uh, industry governing body and then they pimped out those patents potentially to somebody else I mean I don't know that maybe happens I, I don't know that's mm. potentially something mm. that happens um, <laughs> just trying to protect my ass there but basically yeah we're seeing that the the tra- that's the trade it's the people holding the patent so now that yeah the companies are not signing the patent so when GW went and sold to Jazz basically a lot of their people can become free agents and I think GW hold 186, something like that, which pales in comparison to the, the Chinese state, which technically owns all industrial uh, and commercial assets of Chinese companies. It's That's where I think that we're moving is toward these patented synthetics so they can prove through the data that, okay, if mm. this works, it's because of this one compound. I think we're all in content uh, in uh, agreement that the entourage effect is what is doing this. There has to be this certain synergy between the compounds that mm-hmm. is then creating that greater efficacy. Otherwise, we're seeing a drop off. So things like Sativex, even in GW's own marketing, they're discovering this fast drop off. Same as for even quicker in Epidiolex. People are reporting yeah. like, like six weeks. And it's just like, wow, for $32,000 a year or whatever it is the state of charge in it. It's, it, it, yeah, it's we're not- It's so up messed there. up, isn't it? It's so, again, getting back to the disempowering thing, it's like, you know, when you think of like, is it the British Pediatric Neurology Association who, you know, are roadblocking um, all these kids having access to a full, you know, kind of whole plant product, in, you know, with, with a more than legally allowable men- amount of, um, of um of THC you know these not unlicensed products and they're you know various of their you know, sort of uh people involved with the BPNA uh, have, have also been involved with the epidilex studies and and it's just it yeah it just it, I mm-hmm. it just saddens me um particularly as for doctors you kind of makes me question where is their curiosity gone where what, surely they got into this because they wanted people to feel better surely you like you know pediatric neurologists would prefer a child to be maybe even seizure free or certainly reduced seizure not in and out of hospital not losing you know any kind of cognitive pro- progress that they've made above some kind of synthetic product or okay, well, actually no epidiotics isn't synthetic but um that you know, okay, it's been through the RCTs and and they've been involved in doing the RCTs, but that, that, I don't I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Um, apart from I guess you know what's going on behind the scenes. I do think, and I think this is where. So, for example, the 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 doctors who are involved in the prescription cannabis, uh, we call it a market system. You know, for example, I think in, it's for profit, so I think we have to call it a market. Okay, yeah. So in, in the UK. <laughs> I do think we have to be a little bit patient with them. Bless them. Because, uh, I mean, I say bless them, just not, you know, they're earning shitloads of money and and having a lovely life. But, um, you know, they have been told for most of their professional careers that, you know, cannabis is a drug of abuse and has no therapeutic benefits. And they also, you know, have existed within, um, you know, kind of paradigm of single molecule um, drugs that, you know, there's a kind of, pretty standard dose you might have a little bit of kind of up titration but not that much really and then you just kind of send people off and there's you know it's it's fairly kind of yeah simple in a way and then suddenly it's like but no cannabis <laughs> actually yeah. we, we you know we've legalized and i re- rescheduled it you can prescribe it um and so i, I understand then for their little tiny minds like okay how they just have to start with THC and CBD um, and like, you know, the different ratios. Um, and of course it's much more than that, but it's like, I, I do, I, I kind of, I do feel for them in a way. It's like, it's a lot. It's like they're having to like turn everything around on their, on its head really. Um, and also turn around that relationship with, with patients, you know, it's like, 
it's no longer, or it shouldn't be that kind of paternalistic, oh, doctor knows best, because, you know, in, in many instances, apart from possibly with cannabis naive patients, which I don't know the proportion of cannabis naive patients to ones who are, you know, already um, medicating with cannabis previously, it's like the patient knows more, actually. So, um, you know, it's it's... I think there's a lot of doctors who are on a, on their own personal journey and having to kind of rethink how they are as doctors, actually. Um, so I think, you know, as frustrating as it is, and I have heard, to be honest, you know, some not good practice, um, just, just as doctors, you know, not even within kind of bringing cannabis into the discussion, just, and also just like customer service and all the rest of it, yeah. um, with the clinics and, um, but I don't know, I, it's, it's a lot of nuances. It's a lot of nuances, um, which takes mm-hmm. time. And I, I don't know how much the clinics are investing in educating their doctors, you know, or are they just supposed to go and educate themselves? I don't know. I mean, what's your impression? It's, yes, it, it's an interesting one. And it's, again, I, I, I eat humble pie quite quite often on this podcast, but this is something maybe some of my listeners wouldn't have expected me to say, especially given my current situation. But yeah, I agree with you. I think I do have some th- sympathy towards the majority of them that are there for good intention, that are willing to learn. But I also feel that they have both arms tied behind their back by the legislation and regulation. They're not allowed to talk about terpenes. They're not allowed to try and understand that. They're not educated on... They're told that, all right, if we give them this indicator at this percentage THC, it'll do this to them. What we just mentioned earlier about the differences of you and I could sit and smoke the yeah. same color, the same exact plant grown, like take two sides of a branch and have two different effects. When, when the science just is not there at all. And there needs to be this humility on all sides. Mm. That, even, that even with the cannabis naive patient as well, that that patient probably will know more than the doctor. Because guess what? They're the one that's fucking taking the cannabis. Yeah. And, and it's you, their body. It's, it's their their It's, their, exper- it's, it's yeah. their experience. If they're saying yeah. it's helping me sleep and the doctor says no, like, so... I'm not going to reveal that anecdote, actually, because it's a bit personal right now, but I'll tell you what I've learned. I'll tell you what I've learned recently, because I was speaking to, uh, ah, do I name him? Yeah, go on. My mate, my mate, my, I say my mate, uh, he's my mate. I do like to think he's my mate. We've, uh, we've interacted for many years in this, and I do bug him with a lot of questions, and I do try and hold him to account. But uh, War Mike Barnes, fellow northerner, uh, the other day, and he was saying that majority of the people across the clinics are coming from Legacy at this point. Right, okay. Uh, and there is an interesting uh, purge that you may see across some people's Facebooks. Quite a lot of people are having their prescriptions removed at this point. What? And it's be- really? Yes, it's because the Quality Care Commission in the UK have uh, finally created a division of cannabis inspectors that are then sort of going around and basically checking paperwork, et cetera, for compliance. And here's just a bit of heads up for my listeners that have prescriptions out there, folks. They're looking for two things predominantly. One is that you are, you admit that you are combusting their product. And the other is that you are still consuming a legacy product. Ah, uh, which a lot of patients are, right? That's, that's vast, the feedback. Vast, yeah. ma- vast majority, because especially within a radiated market right now, mm. for all the uh, grow, Intrigo and other, uh, I think only Intrigo providing their products, there are yeah. still complaints with seeds, molds, etc. And mm. I got I got into this with Dr. Danny Gordon the other week uh, on the podcast of asking that we're told that combustion is bad because smoking is bad. So they're correlating tobacco studies to say that this has to be bad because it's you're doing the same action. Mm. Yet, yet what we know from vaporization is uh, cannabis is a bronchial dilator. It helps open the linings of the lungs. And actually mm. at a lower, a lower temperature, you are volatizing the, the cannabis flower and any potential byproducts in that, mold spores, et cetera rather than a, a combustion, they are destroyed. For all, obviously, oh. then there is the there is the argument that a combustion, you're reducing the amount of cannabinoids. You are then creating benzene and other byproducts because you are combusting and converting carbon through uh, through fire. But cannabis also, when you're taking THC, CBD, we're also seeing CBG in some studies, but this is very in infancy, have anti-tumoral properties, anti-cancerol. Uh, they also seem to protect the lining of the lungs. This is why the majority of European smokers, cannabis smokers, about 70 odd percent consume tobacco, yet they don't have a higher instance mm. of COPD or lung cancer. It's because there seems to be this offset. So mm-hmm. I think this idea of flat out banning combustion, as you've seen, I, I'm a combustor. I'm, I'm a prescriber. 
prescription patient and currently in contention with the system because of this, because I mm-hmm. don't get the full benefit. I've got a volcano but I, in a handheld way, but I don't get relief. I don't get the benefit. It just does it's not arise it's to It's me. interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, this sort of reminds me of a conversation I had with um, a woman called Nikki Lawley, who's um, um, a kind of patient advocate in the US. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that she was saying, you know, she can bust, you know, she sm- smokes joints because it, that's, that works for her much better. And actually, when I reflect, you know, I'm, I am, yeah, as I sort of mentioned previously, like I'm not cannabis naive, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not kind of embedded in the legacy market. But when I think back to... Um, when I was living in Seville and I was, you know, having my little joint before bed, uh, I don't know whether, well, it's difficult to say, was it the, the chemo bars? Um, was it I was just in Spain and Spain's much better than the UK. Um, but um, the effects I had, you know, in terms of, um, so for me, you know, it's more, it's about kind of sleep. It's about kind of anxiety. Um it, it just felt better smoking than it does vaping actually for me. Yeah. So I do, you know, I have, I have a, a vaporizer, but I just like, I don't use it that much. I don't really enjoy it. I don't really enjoy it. Um, and I'm useless at rolling joints. I better learn really <laughs> simple. <laughs> yeah, like, like, that's what I need to do, but it is interesting. That's really interesting. So the advice then, um, so in, in the kind of, with an appointment with, um, with a doctor, how would it come up that a patient's, is would do they ask if you're getting if you're obtaining um um cannabis from the legacy market on top of your prescription as do they that comes up does it or it, it, it does come up as a general inquiry so the advice that i've been given from several people that i've spoken to within the industry um that i suppose I, I consider loose allies for all moralistically i may disagree with the fact that the the system is operating the way it is I think that they are operating within the best intentions with their fall within it. Um, yeah. So I, I kind of trust them and respect them um, to a certain and lesser degree. And the general consensus is that you can say that you've consumed cannabis previously. You then have to effectively make a commitment that once you take that prescription, you that is the only cannabis you will consume. And then mm. you have to, the, the issue that I've got with this is that the MHRA, doc, MHRA, God, God, Two cents of cotton math here, sorry. <laughs> hmm. One, one of the horrible si- horrible side effects of cannabis, that cotton mouth. <laughs> um, I jest, but yeah. Um, so yeah, having spoken to, to to these guys and girls, basically, yeah, the advice is you can say that you've consumed, but then you have to make that commitment to stop that consumption and that you then can't combust it. But the doctor doesn't say that you are not allowed. Under the mm. MHRA document, it says at the bottom of it, uh, I think it's the smoking of cannabis is still prohibited. Mm. That's that is the just the sentence it says, right? So then the doctors have to give out recommendations. So the doctor goes, "We can prescribe you this, and we recommend you vaporize it." So I asked in a clinical setting with a prescriber, "What does this mean? You're recommending it to me. What if I combust it? We don't recommend you do that." Mm. Okay, if I'm obese and you recommend I go to the gym and I don't go to the gym, there's no consequence. Mm. What happens if I combust this? Oh, we don't recommend that. Mm -hmm. So it's odd. I then got an email from the clinic after the fact, clarifying their position, saying that, and it just said, the smoking of cannabis is still prohibited. Prohibited by whom? By what? What does this mean? Mm. There there isn't a clarification for it. Mm -hmm. And as we're discussing that the vast, vast majority of legacy consumers will come from combustion. Yeah. Because vaporization is a new technology. It's it's obviously it's not the conceptual idea, actually. If you can start there's a couple of the drugs museums have some of the original ones from like the 70s and, and early 80s, the conceptual ideas of them, but these have not been mass market available until the past 10 years, until legalization kicked off in the States effectively. Mm-hmm. So it's it's still a novel and new technology and in, in consumption method for most people. Obviously, mm-hmm. I, I reckon younger people and more cannabis naive people have come into it through illegal means uh, uh, sort of in the more latter years probably will have looked at vapor <clears throat> looked at vaporization but again as we spoke of with the the cbd companies then producing their own blogs and content about how great cbd is we're seeing the same from the vaporization industry so it's 
it's muddy in the waters here and there's no enthusiastic, conscientious, curious and unbiased science in the middle where people are just going, let's look at all. Don't fund me from anything. Just let me leave me alone. Let me look at this shit. Mm. We, we need that across the board because at the minute, all the funding seems to be coming from prior invested individuals that, that are banking on their worldview, their idea being the the, the right science. I'm echoing mm-hmm. that for people that are listening, you know? Mm, no, I, yeah. I mean, ultimately, I mean, it strikes me, you know, um, I think I met you actually when I met you in person was at Cannabis Europa and, um, and <clears throat> you know, the epicenter of, 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 men in suits and and mm. the kind of industry investment side of things but it, it what i understand is there's still not that much money being made it's still an awful lot of smoke and mirrors and stuff so i guess that you know whatever ways of of trying to make some money at the end of all this um they're, they're going to do i i do have a question um because there's something that you know I sort of read a little bit um on on social media and stuff like that um about the naming of the products within the the kind of prescription market so you've got you know i don't know you know you've got some of them which you know kind of gorilla glue and and you know all the kind of chemovar names and then you've got other ones that are like i don't know sort of invented names that are supposed to sound more medical do you have any mm-hmm. any kind of view on that is that does it matter um uh, yeah i think it's the clinics are obviously separate from the dispensaries. So this is one where that the UK system is a little bit difficult in that your prescriber doesn't necessarily know your products. You also have the free will to leave or to be prescribed by any clinic and go to any dispensary. Obviously, as you, you alluded to earlier, the uh, uh, management of customer service, et cetera, still leaves a lot to be desired at this point with it being quite a nascent and, and, and new industry. Um, but I, I think it's experimentation in the same way we see like social media platforms change up their fonts, the sizing. They'll sometimes change the blue of the Facebook and they do it randomly across the board and they're accruing data as to what increase is the reaction what is the, what what do we see and i think it seems to be coming from more of the companies that are trying to hide their so-called recreational roots so the way that there was i'm not going to name the legal firm for my own legal protection but a certain legal firm in this country is alleged to have bullied the financial conduct authority in 2019 and 2020 there was a decision then made in september 2020 to mis- to reinterpret and he said misinterpret which is my maybe opinion but to reinterpret the proceeds of crime act uh, that then meant the air quotes medical cannabis again this is why i think the deliberate use of medical cannabis medical cannabis companies that don't have what was the wording exposure to recreational markets are allowed to then float on the London stock exchange. There's somewhere in the region of like 50 to 60 million on there at the minute with various companies, uh, some dual listing out of Australia and America and elsewhere. Um, and that's what I think the speculation is that they're trying to bring London as a money hub post Brexit for all of this slush money for global cannabis. Um, but so to back to the namings, I think it's the companies that are literally saying Canada that are both, they grow cannabis in one place and they put one label on it and it's medicine, mm-hmm. one label on it and it's adult use drug. Mm-hmm. And so therefore to avoid their exposure when that product comes over here, as long as they can erase kind of the name and the trace of it, it then right. re- it removes the association of the recreational market or the air quotes exposure to it so therefore they can profit and still operate inside the legal uk system because they can't sell you can't sell drugs they're not selling drugs they're 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 selling a prescription medication yeah so it's not a dangerous drug or it's controlled but it's because it's off licensed medication in the uk there's this whole ambiguous area that is kind of in my opinion being propped up by the money men to keep it ambiguous so they can operate within it but then a small guy couldn't interpret that and go, well, wait a minute. Does that mean if you're saying that medical cannabis is cannabis and I, my doctor says I can have cannabis, can I get a piece of paper and grow cannabis? Can I do my own? Like, I feel it's to try and keep mm. the entry narrow and expensive as we're seeing with the licensing yeah. and the rest of I mean, America. How about, I mean, what, what, it just may, uh, yeah, I guess it's like, what is the, in an ideal world, what is um, the kind of the end 
yeah, the u- utopian end goal that may or may not happen. Um, I suppose it could be, you know, we can all grow cannabis, we can, you know, consume it in whatever, for whatever reason, in whatever way, um, legally, um, our own discretion. That would be lovely. Love that. Um, another goal, I guess, could be, you know, obviously we've got this apparently 1.4 million people who are medicating the majority from the illicit slash legacy market, et cetera. We've got the 20,000 who are in the, the private clinic system. Um, we've got the three NHS um, prescriptions, as I understand it, is another goal that, um, you know, that, that, that cannabis medicinal or otherwise can be prescribed through the NHS, basically. So I know an, an argument that I've seen about just in terms of, you know, again, talking about semantics and names, et cetera, you know, it's, it's, it's already this big leap, you know, and the stigma still abounds and um, in, in relation to cannabis. Um, and so for, uh, if there's a product that's, I don't know, Gorilla Glue, it's the one that kind of springs to mind at the moment. Um, and that's always going to be a big leap, right? Um, to be prescribed within, you well, know, the kind of current system. It, it's not necessarily as bad as green crack, for example. Oh, that's a great um, name. Yeah, it's... I'm just uh, thinking uh, of a bum crack. That's yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Well, there's, there's <laughs> uh, well, if we've got this really nice uh, sort of lemony, heady, a uh, cultivar from Alaska called Alaskan Thunderfuck. Um, nice. So yeah, when we, it, I, I agree. It's it's difficult because the cat there's the, there are all all plants in the world that are cannabis are cannabis sativa L. Then we have this argument of indica sativa ruderalis. There are some pure ruderalis cultivars out there that have been captured, hunted, however you want to describe this. They have what have been predominantly used to create like auto flowering genetics. But then in the main market, most things are hybrids. The idea of pure sativa, pure indica mm. is just, it's it's not really true. There are some, some really good projects out there trying to literally land race hunt. So they're out there in the mountains, in the hills, they're in in places like in, in the mountain ranges in South America, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, in northern China, in, in Tibet, that kind of, pardon me, region, trying to find these ancient varieties that existed before we started interfering with them and interbreeding them. Then we can understand that sort of taxonomy. But until we've got there, this idea of then going, that's an indica, that's a sativa, based on the idea that indica sleep, sativa wake, just doesn't work. I mean, for me, an orange terp uh, will wake me right up. For some people, mm. it'll put, put them right to sleep or make them groggy and slow. Um, and it's, again, it's down to that, again, that individual sort of, um, of, of nuance. But until we find a way to describe that individually, it, it's really hard. So if you experience in the legacy market a cultivar that's Gorilla Glue, you're going to try and seek some, that, that in the medical market. And if they're going to obfuscate its name, uh, it, it's it's then harder for you. So you obviously kind of want that connection, but at the same time from the other side, the doctor doesn't mm. want to be in his, in his loveliness and sat there with his, no offense, physician superiority complex or his parental kind of uh, mindset on going, well, I'm not prescribing. What is this? Is this what? It's they're used to these huge unpronounceable Latin names and mm. and these standard things. And I get that that trepidation and that apprehension. And this is where I think there needs to be a culture, community, legacy driven education scheme where the people that can articulate, that can write the books, that can produce the content, produces the voices of the majority to actually get that consensus. Because mm. when I'm I'm speaking to people, the vast majority of patients I speak to are gaming that system and what they are getting as a medicinal benefit is the pot that they can utilize if they so chose to to put other things in and and walk around with but it's the fact that they then feel safe Mm. when they're walking down the street they're less anxious less depressed their shoulders are up they don't feel every time that blue light goes past they're starting to deal with that generational trauma of Mm. fear of the authorities and i think that is the key almost placebo type effect that we are seeing from the prescribing system right now over than what cannabis is actually doing for these conditions because the variety of hearing people ending up with 20 different cultivars over a year because they can't get the continuity of the one thing that actually worked for them when they first Mm. started Mm -hmm. whereas my idea 
ideal system to 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 go to how you spoke of before. I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. I think this the ideal system is everybody is catered for. Yeah. So so there are the pure I say pure there are these synthetically pure isolated created single molecule uh, RCT up the wazoo triple blind studied guaranteed products for very bespoke conditions in very bespoke needs then there are all of the sort of derivable uh, sort of very bespoke oils in certain ratios produced with uh, nano emulsion etc all of those kind of techniques then sort of under that is the ubiquity of experience shared amongst the community so that people can grow and extract safely their own products. So then we don't have people blowing up kitchens with BHO. We don't have people set themselves on fire with ethanol and all of this, that we can and should be trusted with with cannabis. It's not the same as, as heroin and all these other things. Heroin, again, it's a brand. It was created by Bayer as a product that was bastard, a bastardization of nature, and we still haven't got poppies back. Yet if we had poppies in the population, I guarantee you fentanyl wouldn't be as, as needed. And I, I believe that the ubiquity of cannabis, prophylactic consumption, again, it's not a panacea, but mm. it's anti-tumoral properties in a culture where one in two of us are going to get cancer in our lifetimes, I, I think it's worth allowing to proliferate. If it then means people take less, consume less alcohol, they don't smoke as much tobacco. Mm. It, we know it helps regulate with blood sugar, so it's going to help with diabetes. We know that it, it helps uh, even with sort of circadian rhythms. People are going to sleep better, therefore make better decisions. Therefore, it will help with less car accidents, less sort of just angry explosions, less mistakes at work. It, there, there are so many other benefits to it that I think then this medicinal system will shrink to just bespoke need that if you the flower you can grow at home that your mate Dave that the dispensaries that the clubs and all the other spaces if that those products can't work for you then you move into the bespoke medical system so that the doctors that have studied the interactions and understand all of the the nuance of the human body they're then dealing with it based on compounds because clearly what is available in the rest of it isn't available. And I think when that's done, there'll be that respectful line and people stop gaming the system. Because right now I feel like we're we're in 1997. So 96, California went, all right, medicinal marijuana, here we go. 97, there was what, 13 qualifying conditions? And there started to appear to be clinics and places to pop up where a doctor would coach you. And you'd go in and go, how are you sleeping? Oh, damn, he didn't say insomnia. All right. How's your back? All right. Doesn't have physical pain. Um, and he just trying to wait for you to trigger a thing. You go, oh, boom, you mm. qualify. Give me my $100. Here's your piece of paper. Go buy some weed. Mm. And we're in that, I feel we're in that gaming system. And I think a lot of us know it. And there is profit being made. There are people living comfortable lives. But I also feel there are genuine, sincere people. I've heard of, I'm not going to name a couple of the doctors, but I know of at least two doctors that have left the clinically prescribing system for cannabis because of its ethics. Mm, they're, they're, they're mm-hmm. not they're not doing no harm they're not there with their hypocrite i don't know if we take a hypocritic oath but they're not there trying to help and better that patient they're there to game them and make money from them mm-hmm. and i and i'm not speaking that that's the entire system obviously there are some people genuinely getting help and i understand obviously my privilege as a grower consumer someone that can access it quite ubiquitously that some people can't their only access point is through these clinics but what i'm advocating is that if it was more widely available in the culture and if you went to a club and you could have all the conversations about all of the potential and meet people in similar Mm. positions and have them tell you their story that even that is it's gaining that uh that sovereign regaining that sovereignty and autonomy of our healthcare that we are we are first determining our, our own decisions and then as a if we need to, going to the specialist and going, right, I've tried all the things. I've tried changing my diet. I've tried da 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 Now let's look at it. Whereas cannabis is still, in most instances, the last resort. So when you spoke over the Pediatric Association, I, agree, I am going to be polite and not swear, but mm. I very much disagree with what is going on there because they are still recommending brain surgery for yeah. epileptic children before cannabis. Yeah. And that riles me up in a way that i don't have quite the words to 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 articulate at this moment it's not it's not in any which we're right when what's the worst that can happen there from what we currently know the child will be stoned 
Yeah, no, I get we're it. Filling, yeah. We're filling with all sorts of drugs that are then getting them stored. Yeah. But it's 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 again, it's that language. What are, what yeah. is it when you're on morphine? If you're not stoned, what is it when when you you're on uh, benzodiazepine? When you're on SSRIs, SNRIs, all of these other sort of neurochemically adjusting compounds, you are not you. Mm-hmm. So it's again, I, I'm I'm a stickler for the language because I just want an honest conversation, and I feel if we could have that with this kind of standardized glossary of terms that everybody knows what we're saying when we're saying it we'll start to get somewhere but it does feel not without being too conspiratorial that there are elements within certain parts of society that just don't want a well-informed uh, uh citizenry that can make these informed decisions and help each other out or just well citizenry i've not yet i've, I've not yeah. used that word before yeah just well you know i mean it, again it without going down the conspiracy theory route but like the system as it's set up currently is not one to for patients to be well it's for patients to you know be kind of in the midst of polypharmacy and just you know Mm -hmm. and it doesn't yeah it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense um and again thinking you know if that (laughs) that alien coming to earth again you know when you're sort of saying about the 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 um the children with epilepsy you know uh, I don't know if you've had. Have you had Vera Toomey on your on your um yeah. your show? I mean, I just love love Vera. She always yeah. has me in tears. Um, she's brilliant. But just you know, speaking to her over the years, just you know that what what doctors do when these when these children have um, this intractable epilepsy, they just layer one anti epilepsy drug, you know, also antipsychotics, all sorts of things, steroids. You know, Alfie um, um, Dingley was on. Um, you know steroids at some point was going to kill him just layer it upon layer and and you know and all sorts of like horrible side effects and when something doesn't work they don't think to actually take them off it they just like add in another one it's like none of this makes make any sense i mean who wrote these rules you know it's like there, there are sticklers for for procedure and protocol but the protocol sucks frankly so um yeah I don't, it's like it, you know, yeah. it's it's crazy, but sort of getting you know getting back to your point for me, like when I was living in Spain, I I you know I always, I I do feel a bit embarrassed like here in the UK. I suppose I'm in some ways I'm not like risk averse, but like um, it felt so much more comfortable just being able to you know go to a club and as you say, you know I I actually I did write something about it because it was quite you know my my first experience in the club with my old English teaching colleague you know he was and I was just sort of this ridiculous middle-aged middle-class lady you know kind of wobbling along and and um and I remember he was like oh you know he had one of those sort of vaporizers with the big bags I, I know they probably have a name but anyway and so oh, you know try that it's not very strong and like and I was just like totally, it's a Wednesday afternoon and I was totally wasted and I remember like walking through the streets of Seville just like just really really yeah really stones and um but aside from that, you know, and I used to go to the to the club, just yeah, just like you know, asking questions and and um, and it was okay not to know actually, because I, you know, it's on, on the one hand I might be able to write about science and all the rest of it, but there's so much I don't know. I, you know, I, I completely own that, and um, and you know, in terms of like growing, I mean, I'm I'm I would really really love to be able to grow, and and hopefully at some point I'll get the courage and and start to do that. Probably don't tell my local police, but um, and just yeah, just. <laughs> um because it's yeah it's just you know it's 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 i think it's all about the empowering isn't it and i think as well i I like the idea of growing because i think we are you know as a society we're 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 suffering so much um but we just want someone else to fix it we want to like be given a white pill um, and for that to fix all our problems and and for someone else outside ourselves to do that, basically. Um, and so I think, you know, you can tell me your experience, but I imagine if you're like, you know, sovereign of your own medicine, you're growing it, you're caring for it, you're putting all that love and, and attention into growing your own medicine, just that in itself actually has got it on a kind of like, you know, a mental well-being sort of side it's got to be a wonderful experience so apart from i imagine i'll be a bit worried i'll be killing my plants because i'm <laughs> i don't know if i've got it's... green fingers but uh, I'll, I'll get some advice from you but um <laughs> it's um i don't know it's like I, I just think we're we're just stuck in this system of, of disempowerment and 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 so yeah 
I'm I'm very much for breaking free from that. You and me both, and yeah, exactly. It's it's interesting. When I was, I think maybe fifteen, uh, a doctor, a GP, uh, wanted to prescribe me gardening, and I never knew quite how right he was because I I didn't have an appreciation for nature like I do now. Before I started tending cannabis, didn't mm. have house plants. I'd walk in the woods. I'd like to take mushrooms in the woods and whatever else but I didn't have this profundity to how fragile life is and what can come of it if you really put the effort and energy in. And for someone suffering with kind of like CPTSD, depression, ADHD, and various other sort of things, having that consistency and continuity of a thing to tend to every day. Mm. You know, I don't have any parental instincts, never want children, had a very horrible childhood. So keeping myself away from that, I've got, got a cat. He gets, you know, most of my love and helps as well, but having plants like that really changed me. Now my house is, is full of house plants of all different varieties. And I like difficult plants in, in a way. I like, I like to have that sort of challenge because it reminds me to be softer and gentler and calmer. Mm. It centers me. It brings me, um, sort of as Eckhart Holt describes it into the present. Yeah. And so even before I consume cannabis, that makes me feel good. And then having been able to avoid, you know, street dealers and the anxiety of ringing three or four people and being told, yeah, five minutes or meet you in an hour, you know, somebody forgets or you don't know who you're meeting. You, you stood on a street mm. corner for hours, you know, the police are swinging by, you're running around just trying to pick up 20 bags. It just, all of that is not conducive toward the benefits that the plant can provide. So then by the time you actually get an opportunity to consume it, you're just offsetting the the stress hormones and and the neuro mm. neurology and everything else that has just been created in the pursuit of acquiring the thing, and yeah, the idea of of it being of sovereignty of first taking control of it is great for the individual. I think until you bump heads with this physician superiority complex, I have been I don't want to say victimized, but I have been stigmatized by the NHS for decades because I've been honest with them about my drug use over decades, overly to the point of it has been to my detriment. And I still would rather be honest with them and not get the care that I believe and feel that I need and have been told that if I stop consuming cannabis and other drugs would be provided. Um, I, I, I would rather live genuinely and, and sincerely. And I mm. think that there's a lot of people kind of are really struggling right now that they just want that. And it is the thing that's holding them back is the fear of their door going off. It's that 10 armed, big, scary bloke mm. screaming, swearing, smashing your house, destroying your home. The the symbol, the totem of safety, external of your yourself. You know what I mean? The the, the place we allow ourselves to be vulnerable. We love, mm. we share, we shit. That do you know what I mean? To that to be destroyed for a plan, that fear will stop the majority of people mm -hmm. and i think that if we can remove that yeah tax us if we want to sell it but guess what hmrc we're paying more tax than google we pay tax on seeds on our feeds on our water on our electric on our rent we are better citizens we're providing excess product to other people that need it that can't do it mm -hmm. there has to be this again rational conversation about what it is not everyone that's looking to grow is is trying to be pablo escobar not everyone wants to live some scarface gangster lifestyle the media has hyper inflated that tv films still do that yeah there is a subculture of it and there is a gang gang lifestyle and all the rest of it but most people are just entrepreneurs that would mm. be dealing with farmers markets and opening mom and pop shops if only the law was different that mm. violence that thuggish behavior of again not painting everybody don't hate me i love a lot of you folks out there um but the the small few that ruin it and that paint that image to the masses that it, it needs again challenging and unless we can empower the individual they're only ever going to go well you sell it now and that's how i get it so i'll go to you oh but you're now and educate them inform them empower them and they will decide what clinic what dispensary what model lasts it was mm -hmm. I, i'm not a neoliberalist i hate free market capitalism but that's what we live under that's the principle of it supply and demand we demand better supply us more mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and I, and I think you know what i hear from the um the uk um clinics or prescription market is that you know patients do sort of vote with their feet right so there is this 
yeah movement between and you know and 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 clinics are are there very willingly to kind of you know accept new patients from from old clinics and and all the rest of it and and it's i think it's all all right and good you know if it's if it doesn't come up to scratch i mean i suppose it's difficult for the cannabis naive patients you know because they don't have you know they they they're naive they don't know what to expect actually um i think then for them i mean i'm just thinking of um the dad of a, of a of a buddy of mine who's in, like in his eighties, um, and I won't name the clinic, but you know, it, it, rather than the product because they don't have anything to compare it to, it was a really crappy customer service, you know, um, and that that's a basic. It's a basic. You know, it's like be nice to people, pick up the phone, be informative. You know, if you're if you're the consultant, get back to them. It's like these are vulnerable. People who are unwell who are paying you bloody money. <laughs> it's like... Exactly that. Yes, they are a consumer because it is a market and it is a product and a service. But the point of being in medical practice is to provide care. I understand mm. that we can't all be compassionate all the time. I understand that as humans, our emotions fluctuate across the, the bell curve of the human experience. But if you are in these positions, there has to be this this other space within this clinical model of just people that are there for follow-ups, not your 50 pound, 100 pound follow-up appointments, but your person that just checks in on you. How are mm. you doing? How are you feeling? Not are there side effects because it's going to work with their data set, not how has it affected you in a one to 10 because it works with their data set, but how the how are you actually feeling? Yeah. Yeah. How we, do you know what I mean? Because that is what a lot of people are missing from this. And a lot of people find in the legacy community, they find community, exactly that. They find mm. peers. They find others that they can go, I consume cannabis and don't have to then necessarily go to their friends that think that cannabis is a dangerous drug. I've got this medical stuff and then allow that kind of false dichotomy to widen and go, no, it's not the dangerous drug stuff. It's not the bad stuff that your cousin's dog's nephew's niece had that bad thing on. It's, do you know what I mean? And whereas they can be in a peer group and go, well, I consume cannabis and share those stories in a safe environment. And I think that's mm. what miss- is massively missing and what the clubs provide. Obviously, the coffee shops used to do this in, in Holland, but they, again, became far more commercialized. And it was about getting you in, getting the product, buying as much of their services as they can through drinks and food and getting you out. Whereas the clubs are still based on having a unique flavor and they're built by a micro community of people. And then they invite others in and yeah, it changes and it fluctuates and evolves over time, but they're, they're different in their settings. It isn't homogenized. It isn't overly the hygienic standardized experience that we're, we're getting from, from the clinicians. And it's still this, I'm not saying your doctor should suddenly be there with Bob Marley in the background on a giant banner and they should be sat smoking a giant joint or anything. But for people that are used to dealing with Dave down the road and going in and getting to open the jars and smell the weed and talk about it and understand it versus the doctor that's then going, well, THC or CBD, indica or sativa, and that's as far as they'll speak of it. It's frustrating. So I can understand why it then makes the doctor almost like, oh, God. So then when they do get a cannabis naive patient, they're almost frustrated that they don't know what they think everybody knows and they don't know it well enough to tell that person. So and yeah. we all know, we've all had that experience of a doctor that then doesn't know a thing that then will just fob you off. He'll never admit that the girl, well, I'm, my education perhaps doesn't go that far. Let me have a look for a minute and do do something about it. It's always mm. this, no, it must be something else. It'll be never, and they'll obfuscate you from them being vulnerable in that position. Yeah. And, that's, and I think that, yeah, we need more humans in clinics. And this isn't to say yeah. that you're not human, guys. <laughs> it's just to say that we're somewhere in between the, these two binaries. Definitely. You know? I mean, I think there are there are some um, some great doctors. And um, I, I was um, part of the, the the patient conference that the drug science and MedCam co-organized recently, which, you know, had various teething troubles. But I think, you know, it, it, I don't know if you, if you sort of tuned in um simple at all but um but there are a couple of doctors who are part of the panels and i just thought you know you are in this for the right reasons and you do have that humility actually um and i think that's what makes a difference but something that sort of um i heard during the conference that i was surprised actually because i suppose having come from like the world of complementary therapies which is private you know people pay you however much they do and you get an hour um normally depending on what you're seeing but you but they're not like they're kicking you out the door after 10 minutes. It's like you get, you pay for that time basically, yeah. you know, and it's like, it, it. I've heard, I heard from a few patients that 
that um that with the consultations and the repeat consultations or whatever it's um yeah they like try and get it the doctors are trying to get it over and done with as quick as possible basically and um and i did actually you know speaking to uh um a patient recently and she was like and then maybe this is good advice to anyone who's listening she's like i'm paying for this i'm gonna get like my value for money so actually you know she was a, a pain patient and and you know she she's seeing a pain consultant and she's like okay i'm going to ask other questions you know that are not necessarily cannabis related but because i'm going to get my value for money it's not i'm paying for this i'm you know chronically ill i'm probably on disability benefits um this is a big big ask for me financially this is not you're just like there speed writing prescriptions no like get your value for money you know like like yeah. gets your questions in advance. It's like it's um it's yeah, it's it's, it's difficult because I agree, but my second follow-up was six minutes. And wow, yeah. It was six minutes because I mean Which is like what you get with the G you know, with your GP yeah. in the NHS, yeah. and then it's never enough, you know. Yeah. One thing I will advise anybody out there is record, screen record. So if you have it on Zoom, do it on your phone, screen record with the microphone, the interaction. Um, because it will help you later on down the line or it potentially will help you if you then have problems like uh, potentially I'm looking at having. And the reason my follow-up appointment was so short was because I'm aware and they're aware that I'm not necessarily gaming the system, but I continue to smoke cannabis. So I continue to access it elsewhere because their product is not good enough. I explained to them that the therapeutic value that I get from being prescribed cannabis is the pot. The, the mm -hmm. safety I have felt, the security I have felt when out and about compared to previous is mm -hmm. invaluable. It is invaluable. That is far more beneficial than any of the cannabis that they can currently are uh, capable of providing to put in that pot. But having it and being able to walk around and somebody have an issue and go uh, and show it and explain it, mm -hmm. that is invaluable. And that's where I feel a lot of people are getting the benefit. And so they want to get in and out because they don't want to get air quotes caught out. And so we're yeah. stuck in this system where a lot of, again, obviously the most people I speak to are from legacy because I've operated within the legacy industry for, for well over a decade plus now. Um, but they're in the similar position in that it's the pot that's helping them. Yes. Some mm -hmm. of the product is helping them, but that's not the main reason they're getting it. They can access cannabis anywhere. Mm -hmm. But they know that having on prescription means their job's secure. Their license when driving is secure. Maybe well, their kids. Kid, not, kid, their not, kids not are guaranteed secure. though, because I it, mean that it, was something that was something that came up at the conference. You know, there isn't like a kind of joint up approach throughout with the police, for example. You know, it's mm -hmm. like the police are, have oh, it, not been it, uh, educated about this in many cases. They question. They're like, nah, that's what is pot? That could be anything, you know, and uh, DVLA, well, I believe there's problems with DVLA. Yeah, it's, landlords, it's, it's, there's problems with landlords. It's like... There are, there are still issues, but what it ultimately means is that it nullifies the CPS. So you have a legal defense. Yes, you may still be arrested. Yes, you still may be raided. Yes, you still may even go in a cell. You may still be dragged to court, but you have a lawful legal defense that means when the judge sees it, you right. will not be prosecuted. Yeah. And interestingly, I'm not going to name the patient, but we do have a precedent that was set in the UK law that means that we can kind of nullify the DVLA issue. So they're arguing that if then a patient is prescribed X amount, this should correlate to X amount per litre uh, of THC unit in the blood does not work that way. Cannabinoids store in fat cells, they store in hair and fingernails. The body holds on to cannabinoids. It's not like cocaine or LSD. It doesn't try and flush it straight yeah. out. It really holds it because it appreciates them and uses them later on down the line. So there's a compounding effect there. Also, um, they're then saying then building this. So people's tolerances are different. Then if it depends on if you've then just smoked or whether you have been smoking all day as to whether the, the amount of present present in the blood. So we've had a patient that was pulled over. They went through the blood testing and they were alleged to have been over the limit for prescription, went to court, stood litigate in person and got um, acquitted based on the ground the, of, of the science is not there, that the police and prosecution cannot prove that him consuming or the, her consuming that amount would result in this amount. Therefore, we have a case precedent for people to use. The landlords won again. Yeah, that is an issue, especially in private rent. Um, but against the court system, because of the, the law, 
if you have the funds and obviously most people in this position we really don't ever more so we don't given cost of living crisis and mm. inflation etc um again it just means if we can, you can get into that position in a legal setting you are right yeah the rest of it is muddied and you've got to fight that position but it's still a lot easier to fight it with the legitimacy of the pot and the paper that it is just that I identify as a medicinal consumer because that's what they see it as, is just some bollocks that you're going, oh, well, what's the difference between you than shooting up heroin or smoking crack? Which actually, in my eyes, I, I don't really see a difference, but that's a conversation for a different day. Um, but yeah, it's th- there are obviously yeah, these teething issues, I agree, um, mm. on, on all sides. And again, I think they're not going to be solved until we can be honest. Um, I tried to apply to speak at the patient's conference. I tried to be involved with it and hit deaf ears. I'm not quite sure why I am going to obviously inquire. Do you know further. what's important? I, because, um, what, I, because I was involved with, um, it. there was a kind of, well, uh, and I was, I was involved with like kind of speaking like well, selection and it, it was trying to have new faces, actually new voices. So I don't know if you watched any of it, you would have seen there are people that haven't spoken before so it's that kind of, um, and that, that it was, all it was, was that it wasn't like, oh, we're not having that person because X, you know. I didn't, I didn't necessarily feel, feel excluded. Yeah. It's just, just I've, I've recently become a patient and yeah. what, I want, what I wanted was to, to be, have an opportunity to speak as somebody that has come from legacy mm. into prescription, but is still in both worlds. Yeah, I'm yeah, still yeah. an advocate for the decriminalization, descheduling of cannabis yeah. and it's in its ubiquitous use, but because of trying to get uh, a continuation of uh, continuity of care within the NHS, I need them to stop stigmatizing me and restricting my care because of my cannabis use yeah. by getting a prescription. But then I'm having issues with the prescription system because I'm being too honest with them. Mm-hmm. And so it's, mm-hmm. I just feel I'm in this catch 22 where I've been telling the truth for drugs for decades and now I've been proven ever more right with every year. I mean, the books that I read are the, the other champions in the world, the, the hopeful future guests that I've got of the work I've appreciated for decades. Mm. It's proven I'm seeing it come to fruition in now the creation of like the psychedelic industry with the, the cannabis globally. And mm. it's very deeply frustrating to me that I can't have these honest conversations with the direct physicians and people responsible for my care. Mm. It, it, it just feels wrong I'm, I'm 34 at this point i would quite like to just sit in a room with with a doctor and actually talk to them and not have to have not have to worry mm. not have to lie not have to obfuscate and cheat because that's what it feels like and it's moralistically ethically that, that bothers me yeah. and like i said with the cqc the quality care commission now beginning to crack down i fear for others in a position similar to me that i don't want to say have not been smart enough to lie but have just not had <sighs> I don't know, not being pressured enough, not felt fearful enough to to have to lie. I just mm. fear that their, their scripts may be pulled. And uh, can I say this? Fuck it, I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> uh, as far as I'm aware from my preliminary investigations, folks, there is no internal direct connection between the clinics. They may ask you if you've been previously prescribed from one clinic, but you do not have to. It is not a legal requisite for you to tell them that you have. Don't use that in a court of law, or if you do, I'll be in the dock with you. Whatever. I don't care anymore. I don't care. That's as far as as far as I'm aware right now, there isn't a, a direct internal system, folks. So you don't necessarily have to disclose. So if one clinic happens to kick you off one, that's all I'm saying. That's not my advice. That's just some mm-hmm. information. All right, lawyer. Did I get that work? That works. That works. <laughs> We're cool. Um, yeah, so yeah. it's 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 difficult. I just I really, I really hear, I hear that, line and I really value the fact that you, you know, you're very committed to speaking your truth and not lying. And I think um, we're not, in as a society, we're not used to that because we yeah. don't want to hear the truth, right? You know, I think we're, we're, um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm a proponent that we've made things far too complicated, generally with regulation and all the rest of it. Um, but sometimes we're not, we're not ready for the simple truths either. You know, it's. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I, I appreciate, yeah, that you're you're not willing to compromise actually your voice. Um, so yeah, I salute you for that. Thank you. I I, I appreciate that because it's not a very nice road to walk. Um, no. I've seen many. I've seen many of my peers because I've been out of this a good 
eight years publicly, many years privately, as in just advocating for drugs and being involved in the culture and scene. And yeah, I've seen so many people begin to speak half truths, begin to change their language and soften their voice and get paid for it and start companies, mm. work well in the industry and it I but don't you know, but, but but you know what? Interesting on on that note, um to bring in something else I've just started, I mean, I'm just, just in the process, just started training to be a psychotherapist. And so I'm just reading at the moment about subpersonalities. So we have all these like different parts of ourselves, basically. And literally yesterday I was reading uh, something about, um, I think it was like some study that was um, something about like within, um, I'm trying to think what it was now. It was about sort of how employees within a company um voice their opinions to a trade unions depending on whether they were shop stewards or they were employees or suddenly they kind of like you know were, were poacher turned gamekeepers all this kind of stuff and it's like it's part of human nature to adapt our voice to to the world in which we're in and who's going to be listening actually so to kind of to rem- to maintain one voice regardless of of the world in which you know who you're speaking to or or or, or who's around you is, is quite difficult and humans we are chameleons in a way you know it's kind of a part of our survival we don't you know we want to be accepted into the tribe so um yeah so it's 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 interesting and i can imagine you know i imagine there's people who you've been alongside, you know, over these years, who perhaps now are kind of embedded within the industry and suddenly their voice has changed slightly and it doesn't seem necessarily authentic anymore. But I think that's that's just kind of them being flawed humans, maybe in a way, I don't know. Anyway, that's, yeah. that's me drawing on my amateur psychology from two months of training to be a therapist. So I've been interested in psychology all my life because I've been in psychiatric care most of it. Um, so it's yeah, it's interesting. It sort of makes me think almost of the uh, kind of some of Jung's early work uh, when he was talking about before he led on to like the archetypes and was speaking of these kind of inbuilt drivers. Uh, it's also actually, I suppose, quite close to to Darwin and original Darwinism, not social Darwinism, and what Huxley bastardized and did that with. But this idea of the the, you know, the greatest creatures are the most adaptive. It's not survival mm, of the mm-hmm. fittest, it's the most adaptive. And actually, he spoke of like conciliation and compassion. And so I think that, yeah, we move not necessarily as individuals, but with the tribe, partly to be as a fear of, I guess, being ostracized, being left behind. And I think that that part of us has been weaponized in modern times through social media to create like binary towers of opinion. Mm. So there's yes, this, no, that, mm. pro that, anti that. And you've got a signal to one of those towers or else you're, you don't signal. You, you've mm. got to keep sort of, sort of quiet on it. Um, and it's, I think it's partly my upbringing of being ostracized from society anyway, not being in mainstream education, being brought up in what I call them, SEN schools, special educational mm-hmm. needs schools. And I've, I've always felt an outsider. I'm obviously currently going, uh, or try, this is part of the reason to get the, 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 uh, uh, prescription prescription sorted uh, and deal with the NHS di- assessment for autism spectrum disorder mm-hmm. because it's it's part of this I, I struggle with definition and black and white thinking when it comes to this kind of thing that if a word means a thing but then a bunch of people misrepresent the thing and they're doing it deliberately that like I said it like I described before it's almost like itchy it just it bothers me and I have to call it out and I'm still stuck in 2017 when we first started having these conversations and we were marching outside of parliament and mm. we were talking about everyone will be self right to self-identify, grow your own, and it'll be this utopia. And then the language started changing and everyone just starts mm. breaking into different camps. And it was like, is he using the words wrong? What? And it, and I'm, my yeah. brain is, st- I'm still fighting from that position, trying to, and everyone's moved off and doing all these different things, and things are breaking apart, and industries are collapsing, and all the things I screamed about on the live streams I used to do back then, quite a lot of that is coming true. Mm-hmm. And everyone's sort of at this point where we're at an ideal opportunity for convergence, but without a central dictionary index of terms that when we say cannabis, we mean cannabis. When we say this, we mean this. Can we have that consensus in that conversation? Because mm. otherwise, we're just going to end up splintering off again and coming back in five years and go, "Well, that didn't work either." And mm. I feel I'm still, I'm little me is just going to continue plodding on all the way through. I've turned down all sorts of positions because, like I said, I've left roles where I've been asked to compromise 
my integrity, even when it's not my name on the work. Mm. I still feel that the truth is the truth. And again, I think it's, also, it, it, it may, you know, I think there's, we have our kind of um, our internal GPS system, you know, our heart essentially. And I think, you know, it sounds, you know, I, I try and, come from from the heart and i think sometimes you know sometimes we find ourselves in a in a place where we're not being authentic to ourselves or or um, and and it it feels terrible it feels terrible so you know that's kind of and I, and so that's what guides me that's what that's what guides me um and um, and it, as you say it kind of you know it doesn't mean that probably you end up being the richest person in this sector or 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 well, whatever but i think you have to you have to be true to yourself ultimately that's you know it's like this is a long game our lives are a long game it's not about kind of making short short wins in in you know sort of scrabbling up the greasy pole in this weird world of cannabis it's like it's make, it's making meaningful change so um so i do i do hear what you say coming from different you know aspects and a different sort of entry point and um yeah, I think it's always clear when someone is 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 coming from that that, and I and I think actually that 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 place, that heart centeredness normally is what makes shit happen as well. Actually, mm. because it's driven by then a, a true passion. That's why you know I'm I'm sure like for me when I made that promise to my friends in my kitchen in Seville, like without going all kind of woo woo, I, I'm I'm convinced like the you know things like the universe kind of aligned and it all just like. Yeah. just all kind of happened because it was come it came from a pure intention mm. yeah so um yeah I don't know. <laughs> I thought it, it's true it's i think it's a concept called pre-commitment where you you almost start to wire the neurology of your brain and you set yourself for that task if you commit yourself to it in your brain you think i'm gonna do that that and visualize yourself and yeah it makes it almost it's easier it's almost like you yeah you carve a pathway through space mm. time to that result um without again yeah getting too sort of uh pseudo spiritualistic there um but yeah I, I agree and i had a similar sort of thing is that when i really got a hold of myself maybe what 10 11 years ago and came out of the other side of a lifetime of trauma of alcoholism of drug abuse of self-harm and all the rest of it and just actually had this grounding experience and was like, what the hell got me through this? What the hell kept me alive? What is it that is I'm doing? Mm. And I started to really understand the different drugs and compounds I was taking, started to, you know, introduce yoga, meditation, started to like wild camp, uh, you know, like uh, swim in the wild and just really just get back to the human experience and build myself up from there. Mm. And I had the similar sort of thing of this commitment to protect in whatever that definition means, these substances and what they have done for me, that no one can diminish or destroy what they have done for me, that that is an accepted truth and reality. It may not do that for everyone. It's not that panacea. They are not. Not all of these things will do these things, but they have that potential and that should be studied. That should be honored. That should be respected. Mm. And that's what I'm trying to do. And obviously I'm learning through like getting the other side of the Dunning-Kruger effect and coming the other side that there's a hell of a lot I cannot know, will never know, I'm limited to ever know. And that's why I've landed on the podcast is just a collective space where we can try and accrue all of this together and have these conversations and, and advance and move forward, even if it's only in our individual lives. Mm. Because I believe that that's, it's that small domino cascading to the changes that, that alter the world. And so, yeah, I think that's why these uh, these conversations are so important. Yeah. And I think also, um, yeah, to kind of acknowledge our vulnerabilities as well. And, and um, you know, so I really, you know, sharing that yourself, sharing that everything that you've been through and um, and because, you know, it's very easy to kind of show a kind of one dimensional side of ourselves. So, it's you know, it's interesting off camera you were like okay I was a bit reticent about speaking to you because I had a kind of vision of what probably what you were and how you fitted into this you know and it's only until you actually you know show different aspects of yourself which only comes from actually speaking you know mm -hmm. um and and having yeah being have been courageous enough to actually speak speak your truth and just and just yeah just just the curiosity of, of really just trying to 
connect with people as they are, you know, um, and that's, yeah, that's, I think that, that in itself is quite, quite challenging actually. Yeah. It is the weirdest thing that to be human is the hardest aspect <laughs> of, of, of being human. <laughs> we get lost in, in everything else, all of the, the fantasical things and the shiny stuff we've created, but yeah, there is this intrinsic drive for each other to be vulnerable, to be honest and to be open. And I think, this whole cannabis evolution renaissance that we're sort of this revival that we're living through currently, uh, arguably a drug renaissance really when, <clears throat> when you look at it really with, uh, with psychedelics and with what's happening, even with like, uh, numbrino and the medicinalization of cocaine and all the rest of that. Um, the, we have to then have the conversations that are backed up by consensus and by science that we didn't have in the 60s, 70s because otherwise we're going to end up with a lot of people taking a lot of different things and society is going to go, well, this isn't what we wanted. We're going to clamp down and enter a new era of prohibition. And I think mm, that mm -hmm. if we can all be honest at all sides and that means, yeah, the traumatized being vulnerable, but it also means the businessman being honest. Mm. He's saying, I want to make a hundred million at this. Tell us, let us know this. Don't lie to us and say you're here for the patients. Don't placate the people. Don't misrepresent and lobby to get false legislation. We just need that kind of transparency and that that vulnerability, as you describe. And mm. I, I hope that yeah. Ironically, it's we've always stated that the more people that take cannabis and psychedelics, the closer we'll get to that world. So I think we're in a paradox or, uh, or kind of a an inevitable situation where the more that these compounds are medicinalized, therefore the more if they're accessible, the more people question that system, therefore the more chance, but it's just going to be this to and fro mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be this binary fight. As we've said, there should be medicinal, medicinalized uh, versions of these naturally occurring compounds, but there has to then also be the cultural entheogenic uh, therapeutic hell, even just getting high of these substances available to the people. Mm, yeah. But funny though, it's um, it's uh, yeah. Well, that that's a whole other topic. I'm thinking, you know, about this uh, fear amongst regulators and authorities about anything that's psychoactive. Well, unless it's like you know, we talked before about morphine or SSRIs or anything. But you know, alcohol. It's like yeah, it's absolutely fine to get drunk, but um, <laughs> to consume a plant um, that might actually. Uh, expand your consciousness for example that's that's not acceptable and dangerous yes we live in a very odd times in many ways of uh mm. i suppose what it all well describe it double think or that cognitive dissonance and bias mm. where mm -hmm. yeah you will often be told by somebody in a beer garden with a cigarette and with a pint going drugs are bad drugs will be the death of you shouldn't do drugs and it's just i i, I I understand where we are. You can't know what you can't know until you know you don't know it. Mm, mm -hmm. But we have then a social responsibility. It's what I appreciate about our, at least our version and interpretation of modern antiquity is that it was about the commons and the social good and about creating spaces for people to exist and humanity to flourish, not controlled, not contrived, but just allowed to exist. Here's a public park for what? I don't know, if they want to walk the dogs, play frisbee, I don't know, it's space, let them do it. It's not about then, oh, we'll get them there, we'll sell them the coffee and then we'll get them here and buy the food and we'll get them there. It, it's not about the commercial aspect, it was about mm. the humanity. And we, I think we're losing that ever more as we move towards this kind of equal to meta reality and, and moving into oh, potentially, God, <laughs> potentially this future. And, and again, this is what, what cannabis helps in a wonderful way. It's consequentially, no matter what you're prescribed it for, you risk the the potential of getting stoned and ooh, what is getting stoned it's it's like a childlike mindset it allows you to to giggle to laugh to take less serious the stimuli in the situation in which you find yourself mm -hmm. you find yourself looking at the news and instead of feeling horrified you can actually go well what does that mean why are they saying this mm -hmm. you'd be more curious if the narratives around you and i think that's obviously the most dangerous aspect from a totalitarian uh sort of uh, perspective mm -hmm. and that's why i think they're trying to control the the medical market in that it's it's an indoctrination into a worldview you're not getting high you're you're getting healed and healthy and we're not allowed mm -hmm. to talk about the stoned aspect stoned is what you get off the dangerous stuff 
And I think, again, it stops this or it creates this artificial binary that again, in the mm. same way now we saw in America with like oxycodone. So oxycodone is the brand name of oxycotton, which was a deriv- an opium derivative discovered in 1916, I think it was. And it was designed and thought to be in 1916, a less addictive alternative to heroin, which had been released in uh, 1898, which was designed to be a less addictive version than morphine, <laughs> which was designed to be a more pure version of, of, of opium, so you up on that sort of thing. Um, I've lost my point. Damn it, I went too far back in history. <laughs> but no, I just wanted, we were talking about, I mean, I just wanted to sort of touch on on this, um, like if you're medicating with cannabis, you're not getting high. And that's mm. something that I've heard quite a lot. You know, and actually, you know, for many patients, I remember there's a lovely patient called Lorna Bland, I think her name was, who's, you know, cannabis naive, fibromyalgia, probably in her 60s, I think, and just wants to be able to do everyday tasks, like do the hoovering and stuff. And so, you know, she doesn't want to get high and and actually whatever kind of, you know, cannabinoid ratio that was in her medicine, that, that's that, you know, she's there functioning and, and, and having much better quality of life, et cetera. But it's interesting, again, with my, you know, limited experience, but really sort of thinking back to when I was living in Spain. So, um, so, for example, like with depression and anxiety or, or what have you, there's this, for me, actually, um, actually getting really in my own little way, because I, I I feel, but if I'm like in company and I'm high, I start to sort of like get very in, introvert, introspective. And, you know, I don't want to use the word paranoid, but just like I don't enjoy it. Okay. So I, what I would do is have my little joint before bed, be literally in bed. It'd be really high. But then I would have all these insights and and about my own uh, erroneous thinking and suffering and, and almost in the sort of same way you could a little bit from my experiences with like ayahuasca or, or mushrooms or what have you. And so that is therapeutic. That That is, you know, that led me to then understand some of the causes of my, my you know, depression or anxiety. But but that's not something that kind of fits within, you know, the kind of paradigm that we have for mental health, like, you know, SSRIs. Okay. Which is interesting with SSRIs. Okay. You, you take them for six weeks, probably initially, you, you might even feel suicidal, but that's okay. You stick, you know, you stick with them, push through, and then eventually you might feel better. Maybe not. Whereas, you know, my, my let's say very embarrassing, small experience was like, okay, had a joint before I went to bed wow, I could just suddenly understand myself a little bit more and actually the next day live in a different way. And and so, um, I don't know, I think that's, you know, also valid or if not better, I don't know. Massively. You're touching on what is, again, I think a misunderstanding of the cannabis experience is, I guess there's high and there's stoned for loose terminology here. Again, this is why we need this defined. Yeah. In the high is sort of an energetic experience. So you're then consuming the cannabis. Most people are thinking, well, that's sativa, that's indica. Well, it's not. It's that certain terpene profiles in certain ratios will interact with your endocannabinoid system in such a way that you will have either a sedatory or a stimulant-like effect from it. Mm. It's one of these paradoxical parts of cannabis as a plant. And it is to do with, it's the ratios of them. And again, we can't necessarily plot this yet. There is obviously, um, I don't know how much of this is rumor and and conjecture or truth of Israel looking at using the human genome that's mapped uh, to then work out a, a way of basically using data analysis the statistical likelihood of a person that has these markers in their DNA would benefit from these terpenes in these percentages. But again, that's still very sort of new. And that's what's determining the effect. I mean, if you give anybody a high amount of THC, they're going to have the effect of THC. And at too much of a high amount, everybody starts to get overly introverted and you start to get people say they hear voices or they can have like a temporary psychosis type event. And I think what that is, is overstimulation of the internal dialogues. It's your conscience being ramped up. It's your age, your ego, your super ego, all sitting together around a table and going, right lads, let's have a, have a conversation. And we don't often want that. We have to choose to engage in that when it's unwelcomed or uninvited. And for the cannabis naive that has never had that, and it's amplified by a hundred if you've had a couple of pints. So that guy in the beer gone, oh, it smells mate, uh, smells lush mate, gives a couple off. And he has that, whoa, the room, and it's just so, because it's, it's amplified, you then put a drunk brain, you've got high, 
So uh, you've got stoned, I guess, in this parlance, whereas mm. then the cultivar would then would express as more high, they would get more of an energetic stimulant, very talkative, and they'd end up talking shit and very giggly and very uh, and outbound. Mm. And they're the kind of the, the two rough kind of outcomes of cannabis, but we still don't really know that. I, as a, a very experienced cannabis consumer of a couple of decades now, still struggle to identify which kind of cultivars and which smells and which flavors are going to give me each kind of response. And then it's down to obviously your own titration of how, how much. So I would state that for all these people that are not wanting to get high, they're, they are high, they're just not stoned. So they're at the point where it's it's at a workable level, a therapeutic level. So it's providing pain relief, maybe a bit of anxiolytic effect, uh, anti-nauseant, uh, the muscles are a bit looser with anti-inflammatory effects, all the rest of it. So the, the good and the moving and the functioning. If they were to consume a bit more, I think they would then slide towards that stone skill where the body is, it becomes then heavy, lethargic. So I think it's all cannabis consumption. Once you've taken it, you are you are high in some degree. Mm. But I think obviously the medical system wants to avoid that language. So you're medicated. You're at a therapeutic dose or level. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I understand that. But then that 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 muddies the water between people that then like growers that self titrate. So they're like I've grown five strains or cultivars. Um, I then feel like I need a bit of this today, a bit of that. And they don't really track it because they don't have to because they have enough of it. They just go to it when they need it. And when they want to get baked at the end of the day, let's just double up, go heavier. Mm, mm-hmm. it's, and it's about learning, I think, that individual relationship um, with with the plant that you have or the different cultivars that this system is going to be many years behind or, or we could shortcut if, again, we just went and had this honest conversation. Mm-hmm. I do, I do think if there's, if there's, I don't know, kind of, if there's a kind of greater, and I don't know whether this is your experience of having like a greater understanding of yourself, um, mm. when, well, I don't know whether you're stoned or high or, or, or for me, that is, I guess, for my own reasons for, for, for using it, that's for me, that's the bit that I really enjoy actually, just. I suppose it's on my kind of never ending quest of understanding, understanding myself and just, yeah, just kind of um, loosening, loosening up those, those, those kind of neural pathways and well-trodden little motorways that have been going on in my brain for years, you know, that have been quite restrictive and, and brought about suffering. So and you know, for me, that that that's also you know where where psychedelics comes in. But I do think it's possible with, with cannabis. But but you know, and and I think that's something, yeah, that's that's we're trying to talk about actually, potentially. Uh, d- d- definitely. Uh, so I suppose it's described more generally as a, a meta. What is it? A metacognitive agent or metacognitive inducing agent. So you start thinking about thinking. And mm. so you then yes, that's it. Lo- lo- looking da- <laughs> looking down at the motorways, I often describe it as uh, and sort of like sand on a beach and the waterways are channels. So these continual thoughts that then become habits and habitual behaviors become the ingrained channels. And obviously we know through like neuroplasticity and neurogenesis that we can create new pathways, absorb change, alter those kind of pathways. And I think that when you are stone stoned, you are couch lock, you are stuck in there to the outside world. Look at him not doing anything inside. You're like thinking, oh, when I was 15 and I went to kiss that girl and it was really awkward and she didn't want me to kiss her, but I thought she did. Or you end up thinking, oh, I stepped in dog shit the other day. Or like you bring all this, you just start dealing with this backlog of all of the stuff in your consciousness that you normally don't get to. And for a lot of people, we live in denial. We're designed, brought up, and indoctrinated into to being that way. I'm just going, everything's in front of me. It's fine. 24 hour news cycle. Yesterday doesn't matter. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And very few of us stop. Most people go home and drink alcohol to slow their brain. It, it's a, a, a neural retardant is the language that they use for it. It doesn't kill brain cells, but it slows down the processing. And it also helps ingrain these further pathways. So you're not challenging the way you're thinking. Whereas then if you go home and smoke a bit of weed and you, you start, oh, damn, why did I say that to my boss? Tomorrow I'll go in, I'll do this. And it's a harder life because you're not in blissful ignorance being a kind of irregular cannabis consumer. 
And yes, it can feel like you're being a bit paranoid or people thinking about whatever. I just say it's a heightened awareness. And if it then becomes problematic, reduce the space that you're using it in. If you're then too high in public, don't be as high in public. If you need to then be uh, medicated to have the therapeutic level or whatever, find that level for yourself and then be able to operate it, but then choose to be introspective with it when you want use it as a meditation aid i think is a, is a really good thing when you're really trying to just go okay let's go into this because even just viewing that crap it's like um cookies on the on the internet that you've you've got all these cookies from all of this experience and all these thoughts and everything else if you don't go and delete that crap it's going to start to slow down the way your brain's mm-hmm. working and i think we crave that as humans but the experience of instant gratification and everything should be positive and lovely and I get, I'm get i entitled to everything, which is the human experience under capitalism, means we negate that, as Jung described it, the shadow self. Mm. And we, we, we allow that. That's where all of our darkest desires and all of the malicious behaviors and our spiteful actions come from. And cannabis, I think, is a wonderful aid to face that. And I think the later in life you're introduced to it and the more traumatic your life has been, often the more uh, extreme of a rejection you can have from the experience because you you don't want to look at that shit. That's it's too painful. It's too traumatizing. It's too hurtful, you know? Do, do you think, because we, you know, we talk about um, psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, is there some argument for cannabis assisted therapy, for example? Um, uh, not so much necessarily that there's a therapist guiding the experience, but the therapeutic support to unpack stuff that might come up through. Um... I think support support group style would yeah. would, be, would be quite would be really quite good um, to be able to yeah it, share not just the experience of what it is to be high, but share the vulnerability of it because a lot of people. When people speak of like the good old days, I think of my generation as well, of, oh, we used to smoke back in the day. It was a bunch of lads often, most often, at a point where masculinity was kind of described as being, you know, fights and and aggression and and hyper-action movies and all the rest of it, and men weren't allowed to be vulnerable. But a bunch of dudes would get together, smoke some weed and just talk some shit. And then talk about fucking anything and everything. And there wasn't a judgment. There wouldn't be, there maybe be the odd sort of laugh of something, but it would be jovial and in, in, in an inclusive way and in a way of making that person feel welcomed and better about what they're talking about. And that experience, I think, is being lost from the cannabis culture the more it's being commodified because it's then about making money from these people rather than creating spaces. This is why I think cannabis mm. events and clubs, uh, the this dozens of events go off every year in this country. There's, there's not as many clubs as there used to be, but there's still many social spaces where people want to congregate together. And it is ultimately they're sharing the vulnerability of their human experience. They're looking for acceptance in their peer group because Mm. once they walk in that walls, they know automatically everyone around them will not judge them for using cannabis. Whereas everywhere else they go, they have to be fearful of how they smell, what their eyes look like, if they're Mm. slurring because they're a bit high, what emblems they're wearing on their clothing because they will be judged for it. Whereas this social acceptance, again, massively therapeutic, but it then creates a, a peer a support group in a lived and living experience environment that I don't think clinically can be provided. I think it should be financially potentially supported by the the medical systems um, and maybe in some way regulated loosely, but the people within it should be the same as like the needle exchange programs and the work of like George Charlton and others about creating peer champions that can then support others that are respected because they've lived that shit. It's not some doctor that's just walked into it or no offense to yourself or others that have just come into this in recent years. It's someone they can really connect with. And I think Mm -hmm. that is, that that's invaluable right now. I've said, honestly, I believe discourse debate and discussion is what will save humanity. We have to be open with each other about what Mm -hmm. the hell is going on because otherwise we're not going to get anywhere. So I, I think, yeah, championing that, is something that needs to happen, not just in this country, but sort of globally, because the social consumption element, it's its massively important as well to not feel the pariah. Yeah, you may be prescribed it, but you may still feel that you're running around and hiding on a back alley and hitting your vaporizer. You mm. still feel that stigma, you still carry that shame, whereas you can walk into these environments and go, wait, there's 
thousands, millions of people around the world that live like this. This is their culture. And it, I often use the analogy of the LGBTQ plus community in that we need to congregate together and create these spaces to then be able to champion for each other. If you consume cannabis, I don't care why. If you fight for it, you care for it. I will fight for you. And that's the environment I, I want to see mm. you know, perpetuated in this country. Hmm. Well, uh, amen to that. I think really, because I mean, you, you know, there's so much isolation, isn't there? And if you're, yeah, anything that's that's breaking out of that isolation and building more connection and community, particularly if you're unwell, you know, it's like which in itself is isolating. It's yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, so, yeah. so that's sort of my hopes for the future with this. Uh, it's quite a. Uh, pessimistic optimistic sandwich i suppose in this podcast um <laughs> i'm uh, quite aware of time so i think yeah. we'll move on to two quick fire questions okay all right, all right, oh. yeah. um obviously yeah you, you're a published author and you wrote sort of the yeah. essential guide to cbd you've obviously yeah. alluded, alluded to the fact uh during this podcast that you're not uh sort of working within the industry for various reasons do you have mm. an intent intention to uh write another book uh yeah maybe i mean like at some point, um, I'm not sure what it'll be about. I mean, at the moment, um, something that I want to really get off the ground, and it's just very at the kind of initial stages, is almost coming full circle. So um, I feel very strongly that um, palliative care, end of life care, is barely mentioned when it when it comes to this sort of nascent mm. cannabis space or whatever. Because for obvious reasons, if you're dying, you know, you're you're kind of yeah, you're, you're not so consumer. vocal, are you? Yeah, well, also, you're, you know, you're not, it's, it's. I think in terms of the patient's side of things, it's the people who can kind of shout the loudest, really. And if, you, and if you're dying, you you haven't got that voice. So, um, and for me, it's it's a really low-hanging fruit when it comes to, you know, with, with all the kind of the stigma that's still attached and the fear, et cetera. You know, I, I saw my mum was, was dying and sort of in the hospice, like, the kind of the, the rules, not that they go out the window, but like I remember seeing like a patient in the room opposite was like allowed, he was having a big old gin and tonic. And it's like, because you're, you know, it doesn't matter if you're going to be dead in two months. It's like, there's not the, oh, will they have psychosis in three years? It's like, no, they're going to be fucking yeah. dead. So if there's something that actually can just, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, of this podcast, just, just help with that process and, and make it as, as bearable as possible, not only for the patient, but for, for their loved ones around them. So, so I'm just really, and I know a few people that, that I've spoken to feel, feel the same because for a clinician working in palliative care, it has got to be a gift, you know, um, a, a patient being prescribed cannabis or using cannabis themselves, self, self-medicating or whatever, because, you know, it's going to help with their pain. It's going to help with their sleep. It's going to help with them. You know, you're not going to have to give them, um, I don't know. There's a drug for the nausea, for the nausea that they get with the, the the liquid morphine and and something for their for their constipation. You know, it's like it's a gift, and yet um, there's just such a lack of 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 education and things moving forward. I think um, within the hospices, um, particularly with nurses, maybe because you know, particularly if they're going into patients' homes and they're coming across patients, you know, who are be it CBD oil or cannabis oil, whatever. Um, so there is a curiosity. So um, so I'd really like to get something off the ground um, to try and move the, the the argument forward with that. So whether it's, and I don't know how it's going to work. I've got, you know, I'm, I'm having a few conversations about that at the moment. Um, but um, even if it's some kind of like data gathering exercise, first of all, just to kind of, you know, see what the situation is. Uh, I think sometimes you need to start with that, you know, some kind of, yeah, observational, I don't know, some some data gathering exercise. Um, um, how, you know, how many patients who are in palliative care are using cannabis? You know, what are the benefits that they're, that they're experiencing? Just something. And then also, you know, what the experiences of the palliative care clinicians, you know, they, they, they don't know what it is that their patients are bringing into the hospice or wherever. So I feel very, very, I wanting to kind of harness that passion that, that got me into this world in the first place, because, you know, it, it, it has been dwindling in all honesty, um, a little bit of late and and i think it would be a, a deep shame because i know when i'm impassioned i can make shit happen so um so that's that's kind of um something i really want to work on and just 
just uh, yeah i don't know what my end point is with it so i don't know maybe it at some point nice recommends cannabis for for patients at end of life stage or or i don't know but that's something that i want to do simple and i feel very very strongly about it and if anybody's listening who you know feels equally impassioned you know i'd be delighted for them to get in contact i just want to build something that you know has some lasting lasting effect a little little merry legacy maybe yeah no i get and respect that and it, yeah it is sort of coming full circle i think uh one of our mutual previous guests would be quite useful tom curran um oh lovely tom the, yeah yeah, mm. yeah lovely, lovely man uh and the general sort of right to die movement i think they're obviously dealing up there on the, the lowest end of it whereas this is then kind of an entry point to it and there's a lot of ambiguity of middle ground and again you sort of alluded to earlier that all well, humans will do just about fucking anything to avoid thinking about death yet we're all going to die and we all deserve dignity and respect within that um and so i think kind of bringing and building a bridge across that I think there's a gulf of amazing stories of people that mm. have obviously not been doing this. I mean, I remember a few years before my my, my uh, grand died, um, and I sort of as it were, came out about my drug use and started admitting what I was doing and really had these conversations. And she worked in palliative care, uh, often around uh, uh, children for, for many years, and then she moved into adults. And she'd been a nurse in her whole life. And she was saying in, in the 80s, in the 80s, they, they knew a bloke that could get sticky cannabis oil um sort of thing and that was brought in for some of the literally it was the 24 hours they were dying sort of thing it was when mm -hmm. they were literally with we, we legally if we give them another opioid we'll kill them but they're still screaming they're still mm -hmm. in agony their family is coming they deserve mm -hmm. to be to be sent and seen i'm getting emotional thinking about it but they deserve to the people that watch them die to not suffer themselves as well yeah. to not leave trauma yeah and so they would literally gum them up with it and it would, mm. it would it would obviously there was there's probably historically obviously my grand's dead you can't come after her now guys um <laughs> historically maybe contraindications with some of the medications or whatever but they were literally on sort of life support at this point and they were sort of it dying doesn't, the, it the doesn't matter that stage i mean contraindications it's like you know at that point and it's, you know that's the really really at the end point actually you know it, it obviously can can be be a benefit much earlier than that but yeah, good. Yeah, interesting that your mm. yeah that your grand that your grand saw that, and 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 it is often nurses, you know, it is often nurses who who aren't so bound, they're, and they're more in touch with their humanity. I think um, they are not first, so bound to the patient. Yeah. yeah, they are, they are, and that that's you know that's what it's about. So yeah, so you know, it may be that through the nurses actually is how I kind of enter this area i don't know but i know that it's something that i want to make some kind of change along with other people you know who can can be on board with this and help to move this forward excellent excellent uh so it's a quick fire last question is the one okay. that i ask really all of my guests uh you've kind of alluded to to some of it already um what does the future hold for you um <laughs> Yeah, that's difficult to say. I mean, as I say, I am I am actually kind of hot, like one foot out of the whole cannabis world in the respect that I'm I'm training to be a psychotherapist, and I'd, I'd actually really my vision for that is to to be involved with the psychedelic assisted therapy actually, because um, the therapeutic aspect is really 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 key as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, in the meantime, um, I'm you know I'm yeah just to just keep doing what i'm doing really um and you know that's why i kind of talk about this the kind of palliative care project being possibly my legacy i'm not about to die hopefully touch wood but it, you know maybe that's that's kind of the last key thing that i do um you know will i write a book i don't know i'd rather do that actually because i think that would would be an important change to kind of usher in if i if i can in any way yeah I get that. I get that. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh, I, yeah. I really have. Are you it's, surprised, it's... Simper? No, 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 not at all. Uh, like I said, I, I really appreciated uh, kind of getting it uh, clear in the air up front again for the sort of the folks that didn't see. Basically, all, all I said is that, and my audience are pretty aware of this, I'm dealing, trying to deal with my own internalized kind of traumatic classism. Um, 
And yeah, I guess I had a, a prejudice or assumption based on the fact that our algorithms online never really sort of crossed over. We'd maybe sort of spoke at a few events, but um, mm. never really had the time to to really interact with each other as human beyond kind of presenting as as the yeah. uh, the facades that we all do in public, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I I respect what you do, and I really am grateful for you taking the time and. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed this. So, so thank yeah, you me much. too. Me too. Us, us, lovely, lovely humans trying to do our best in this world. That's all we can do. Indeed, indeed. And I think the more that we can be uh, vulnerable and human around each other, the the better the world will be. Doesn't mean any of us will know what it'll look like, but I guarantee mm. it'll feel it'll feel a bit nicer. <laughs> yeah, lovely. All right. Well, I hope to see you in person another time, and uh, give you a, a human hug. If that's okay. Yes, yes, yes. I am a hugger. I am a hugger. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I do look forward to it. All right. Alrighty. I'll let you uh, you leave now, and I'll do a bit of housekeeping, and I'll include some links uh, to your website and whatnot below. Um, okay. But, but yeah, thanks again. Really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No worries. I'll see you later. <laughs> Bye. 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 Well, there you go, folks. That was uh, Mary Biles, and yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. Uh, it was nice to just have a nice bit of honest vulnerable kind of human to human interaction um i'll admit obviously as i think we discussed in covid i kind of had i guess my own prejudice of who i thought mary was and kind of how she'd operated in this space um and yeah i was pleasantly surprised to hear her agree with some of the kind of issues that i see within the system for her to highlight uh several more of them as well and for us to discuss that and i thought it was a very open and honest conversation about kind of the state of the industry, kind of how we've got here, uh, potential discussion of some of the pitfalls that we're, we're facing moving into the future and a few of the kind of optimistic ideas that we could uh, uh, implement in order to kind of move us forward in a way that's, you know, amicable, acceptable and well, plausible for all, pe- all people in the population because at the minute it does still feel like profiteering. It does still feel like manipulation it does still feel like we're having to be dishonest to get protection and it's it's frustrating to me it's deeply frustrating to me that we're not having these truthful discourse this dis- truthful discourse we're not being able to discuss openly what is happening um with the professionals involved with the authorities with our peers with the media with the press with everyone it's just yeah, I don't know if it's just me. That's the way I feel. I feel deeply frustrated. I'm obviously grateful for the advancements in the system and the protection that a small handful, uh, proportionally a small handful of people have been afforded, but it still feels like it's predicated on half-truths and, and dishonest practice and for the means of still profiteering from prohibition. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Anyway, uh if you've enjoyed this folks please do like share subscribe uh you know we're trying to get over a thousand at the minute so if you you know you're watching this on your friend's phone hit a little subscribe for us um if you take their phone just not get them put the password in go on youtube boom subscribe help us get over a thousand (laughs) check us out on uh all social media platforms at simple life uh if you really really enjoyed this check us out on patreon where for less than a cup of coffee a week you can help me keep all of the many lights on and pay the many bills that occur uh to keep this little project of mine going and we want to keep this free forever and as far as i'm concerned advertisers are free forever as well because we always want to have honest uh truthful debates and discussions here and i don't ever want to be censored by anybody um so yeah let's hope to keep that continuing all right peace and love folks we'll be back with somebody next week i'm sure it'll be good you'll enjoy it all right see you later